The Grapevine Genomics Encyclopedia is a web portal that converges different sources of open access data, integrating biological knowledge, genetic and genomic resources, and customised services for the entire Grapevine scientific community and industry, including researchers and companies from different fields related to grapevine cultivation. Due to its economical importance, grapes are an agricultural commodity. In 2020, vineyards destined for the production of table grapes, raisins, wines or other products occupied more than 7 million hectares of land worldwide. Scientifically speaking, grapes are an excellent model for other crops. This is mainly due to research generated around the Vitis species. Being the fourth plant with its genome to ever be sequenced, the amount of next generation sequencing data being produced in grapes positions its research community in the hotspot for genomic resources. Despite the huge amount of public data available, these resources are now dispersed and most of them are not interoperable. Our community needs to grow strong and united to take full advantage of all resources being generated. The information we can gather on plant phenotypes and omics resources has an enormous potential when facing challenges of the near future, like global warming, pathogen resistance and sustainability. The possibility to design new cultivars able to cope with environmental transitions and pests and ensure eco-friendly cultivations depends on how we use all these resources. The Grapedia initiative is an outcome of the Cost Action Integrate, which has greatly contributed in providing the ground basis for the integration of grape resources. Integrape has generated guidelines for the fair treatment and generation of standardised data, allowing them to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Integrape has contributed towards the release of the latest and most updated reference genome assembly of grape, together with the world's largest gene catalogue of functional data, and has also served as a hub of tools for data exploration and analysis. Despite these advances, there is still much room for improvement. These in-house resources do not fully interoperate Neither are they linked to other important, highly accessed resources generated by the community, such as the grapegenomics.com portal or the transcriptomics data exploratory tool Vespucci, among many others. In Grapedia, we aim to integrate and intercommunicate these resources, offering them to the community in an innovative, dynamic and centralised portal. Grapedia will work as an open access platform, allowing worldwide access, thus guaranteeing global impact. Grapedia will allow the user to explore and visualise data in multiple forms, helping researchers and the community to elaborate new hypotheses and plan new experiments. Grapedia will have a user-friendly interface and will be fully equipped with tools and software designed for our community to ensure the best benefit. And finally, Grapedia will count on a commercial exploitation plan, allowing its own sustainability while allowing it to grow. Implementing Grapedia will be based on three main pillars. The community, generating an exhaustive amount of data of different types and nature. The Grapedia Federative Database, which will collect this data, pre-process it to make it readable and organize it into modules. The services of graphical, interactive and exportable nature, some of which will be free while others will be customized and offered at a fee. Examples include browser navigators, dashboards and experimental workflows. These services will be offered back to our widely diverse community, whether they are people working in research to those in industry. Our community will benefit from tailored application programming interfaces and implement innovative technologies such as deep learning and artificial intelligence methods, proving the best tools to face near future challenges.
In building Grapedia, we need to be strong and unified. Despite the many achievements as a community, we are still dispersed. The awarded Cost Innovators Grant will provide network building tools for the first year of implementation. Nevertheless, we need your help for long-term maintenance, growth and expansion of this portal. The support of both the research and industry fields is necessary to implement Grapedia, whereas your support will be essential to embrace the continuing development, because the future of Grape relies on us, the community. So, I hope that you can all hear me. I am really excited and happy to welcome you to our kickoff meeting. So, uh, please let me know if you can hear me. And we have right now um, more than 200 registrations for um, this kickoff meeting. We are so, so happy that uh, the message was well delivered. Um, we also believe that the, the whole project that we will present to you during this day, uh, we need everybody from the community, from the Grayband community to join us. Um, right now, we have more than 200 registrations across the planet, as you can see here in the map, a huge representation throughout Europe, North America, South America, also the Asian countries, um, and of course, as well, Australia and South Africa. So we are really, really happy. Among the um, type of participants in this kickoff meeting, we have um, most of the participation coming from the academy. However, we were really happy to see that people from the industry were also interested in participating in this, uh, this uh, kickoff meeting and hopefully throughout the whole uh, Gradepedia project. So uh, within the industry, we have people working in, in the IT departments, bioinformaticians, but also people working in the marketing and communication departments, directors, CEOs, and, and uh, principal researchers working uh, in collaboration with all the academy as well. So we are very happy and we welcome all the people from the industry Please feel free to ask and give your insights and your out, uh, inputs on this project as well. We will be very happy to, to hear from all of you. Among the academics, we have a, a wide and uniform um, um, uh, amount of people coming from different um, levels. And so we have undergraduates, we have graduate people, we have researchers, uh, professors, and, um, and research assistants and master students as well. So we have a big representation of the whole uh, academy universe. So thank you very much for attending this uh, kickoff meeting. We hope that you will feel uh, encouraged to uh, ask questions, to participate, and uh, at the end, uh, contribute to the development and establishment of what we believe it's gonna be the most important and centralized portal for grapevine research. We would like to um, dedicate and thank uh, the sponsors uh, for this first part of the, of the project. We started the 1st of November and we already count on, on big and um, important sponsors. First of all, our uh, project is partially funded by the cost Innovators Grant. So COST is the European Cooperation in Science and Technology um, Office um, funded by European Communion. And we got uh, funding for one year to establish the networking tools and to be able to gather all the people for working in the development of Repedia. After this one year of uh, grant, the idea is that we pursue on uh, the accomplishment of the of the of the database and we should find new ways to fund and new ways to uh, incorporate uh, all the actors that want to be involved in the project. Um, in addition to cost, we will also like to thank our um, sponsors Sequencia, 
a biotech, a bioinformatics and computational biology company uh, who has been not only with us in Greypedia, but also tightly connected with the Integrate Cost Action. Uh, we really thank them for, for being always very supportive in, in all the activities uh, that we have planned for Greypedia. We will see later on that they have uh, a high participation during this uh, first grant uh, year. And they are also the IT support right now for this kickoff meeting. So thank you very much, Sequencia. Um, in uh, second place, we will also like to thank the first sponsors of Greypedia, which are companies. Uh, the first one is Novatech, uh, uh, which is part of the Mercier Group. Um, Novatech has sponsored this kickoff meeting and is also a very important part of our SIG team. Actually, one of the people from Novatech, Hamil Miton, is part of our SIG team. And finally, we will also like to thank uh, Gallo Winery uh, also for sponsoring, uh, sponsoring us um, and throughout the, the whole year of this uh, first establishment or implementation uh, step. So we have a very busy program. Uh, I hope that you will be all uh, present. However, if you're not able to attend some of the of the presentations, don't worry, we, have, um, we are recording uh, this kickoff meeting, and we will have it in our favorite social media, um, especially uh, also in YouTube, Twitter, and in also a, other uh, social media that we will comment on later on. So the program has basically three um, blocks. The first one is the presentation of the project, the presentation of the team, and of the activities within this first grant period. Um, where uh, the whole community can participate. And we hope that uh, you will be interested to uh, assist in some of the activities that we have organized for this first year. Mm, we will have, after the lunch break, a second block in which we will uh, gather some experiences from um, uh, other study cases, such as the WIT community. And we will also uh, hear from um, people with expertise in database um, in implementation and also in the generation of other type of data that eventually we will be interested to include in, in Greypedia. After this first um, block of the afternoon, we will have a coffee break and then we will follow up with uh, the implementation of Greypedia and see how the ongoing resources we have for Grapevine can be easily implemented and, and how will be the best way to do uh, this uh, integration. Uh, at the end of our program, we have a round table where we will uh, discuss the ongoing activities, the scientific missions that we are already conducting to uh, do the first pilot and the first implementation of this uh, portal. I, I hope that if you have any questions, comments or, or doubts, please use the Q&A section within the, the Zoom platform. We will try to answer them on real time. Um, if we are not able to answer them immediately, at some point we will. So uh, please don't worry and, and uh, send all of your doubts, comments, and uh, we will be happy to, to answer them. So uh, it's very important to, to talk about the origin of this project and, and this initiative. Uh, so Greypedia stems from uh, the deliverables that were accomplished within the Cost Action Integrate. So the Cost Action Integrate um, was a networking uh, platform for not only European researchers, but people from all around the, the world to connect, to, uh, ha uh, to establish li a link uh, for research and developing the tools for what we believe is the basis of Greypedia. The Cost Action Integrate ended on uh, September this year and counted with uh, Mario Pezzotti as the chair and Anne-Francois Damblondon as the vice chair. Um, they were really, really good in uh, making this network a flourish and making this work network really productive. Um, we had, just to give you a, a, a short brief, uh, many, many activities related to the development of guidelines, tools, 
uh, genome assemblies um, that were later on available for the entire grapevine community. We had training schools, we had uh, scientific missions with a lot of international mobility. We have many publications where the cost action integrate was uh, acknowledged and we had also a lot of dissemination. Now Grapedia, uh, it starts from the deliverables that were um, created in Integrate. These deliverables basically uh, were the ground basis uh, and they consisted in fair guidelines and some tools that we hope now to integrate together with all the available resources that the great community has um, created through the past decade, and we hope to showcase them on a single centralized portal. Graypedia, the Grapevine Genomics Encyclopedia, as you have seen in our dissemination video, uh, it's uh, partially um, funded by the Cost Innovators Grant, and this first grant period will allow us to use the same activities that were used within the cost action integrate. So we will have training schools that we will explain later on. Uh, we will have also short-term scientific missions that uh, people from the community can apply. We will have a lot of dissemination as well. And especially we will have a business plan. So um, the cost office helps, uh, will help us to elaborate a business plan for the um, uh, ability of doing a, a good maintainment and uh, growth of the, of the portal and allowing commercial exploitation. Uh, it's important to say, however, that the philosophy be from behind Gradepedia is of full open access. So all the data that we will um, have in the database will be offered open access because it has been generated by the community. So this is an important aspect uh, and not only the open accessibility of the data, but also the interoperability. And so the data will be standardized for everyone to use it in their best ways. Now, among the commercial exploitation, as you may have seen in the video, what we will offer is specialized services, services that will be customized to either the industry or the people in research to conduct specific analysis. And this is what we hope that will help us to maintain the database in the future. So very briefly, this first year uh, of, the, of the SIG grant, um, we'll have a lot of activities that some of them are already starting, as you will see here. Uh, we have some uh, scientific missions that already started um, at the beginning of our CGRAM period. Uh, a few other are uh, planned for the rest of the year. However, um, we have around six uh, short-term scientific missions still to be decided. So we welcome everybody from the community to um, apply for these short-term scientific missions to help us build the database. We hope to have also two training schools that uh, Anne-Marie, our secret hold manager, will, will comment on them afterwards. Uh, within these two training schools, we hope to add value to the database or to the portal and include some specific softwares or APIs, um, uh, application tools that will be of benefit for the database and for the community. We hope to have um, at least three different um, uh, types of database. The first one, the first pilot, uh, which ho we hope that we can um, um, showcase to the community so they can give us uh, the first inputs to modify, to improve, and so on. Uh, one after the second training school, and then a uh, beta testing portal by the end of the grant period. However, it's very important to uh, comment that this is a, will be an ongoing project after this first year of the uh, cost seek grant period. The, the first year is gonna be divided basically in two work packages, as you see here. The first one has to do with the build out of the database um, that will be during the, the, the first 12 months uh, of the project and basically is establishing or implementing a pilot with part of the data. And this pilot will help us to see what things we can change or what things we can improve for, for, the, for the beta testing uh, model. The second work package um, is a little bit more challenging and, and we hope that we can add 
other types of data. So the first work package will be basically genome literature uh, and uh, functional data. And the second work package, we hope that we will be able to integrate other sources of omics, such as metabolomics, proteomics, and also phenotyping data. And eventually, uh, our big goal is to include also climate data for allowing to model uh, scenarios and to try to um, cope with conditions, especially climatic conditions that are actually now affecting grapevine cultivation. Um, during these two work packages, we uh, intend to facilitate and implement different tools that these tools you see here uh, will be part of each one of the, of the, of the work packages. The portal will be divided in, in models and these models will be models that will be most of them uh, stored uh, outside of, the, of our database. So the idea is to interconnect them and to offer them on a single interface to the entire community. Um, this federative type the, uh, data system workflow will allow us to increase the speed and, and um, improve the efficiency on how to present uh, the data coming from different databases. Uh, some of the data probably will have to be stored locally, other data will be present in other databases, so mm, we will have a kind of hybrid situation, but uh, the original philosophy is that we have a federative system. Um, so far, we have already, even though we started the 1st of November, we have been very active through the whole year uh, in trying to uh, reach the community, not only the grapevine community, but communities of agriculture and, and food uh, and communities uh, for genome uh, assemblies, for pan-genomes assemblies. So we have been very active in establishing uh, connection tools, we have been and been participating in many cost events, such as the one that I show you here, the cost connect in a food and agriculture event in which we were able to connect with other cost actions and try to um, comment on ways to improve the deliverables from each one of the cost actions and to uh, comment also on on, on the difficulties or the ways in which we can improve the networking tools. We have been also very active with some other communities, such as the AgBio data. We have been uh, presenting our um, in initiative to, for instance, this consortium. And we hope that we will be able also to um, showcase our portal to the whole scientific community, not only the, the grapevine. So these instances are very important for giving visibility to the whole, um, to, the, to, to our project. We are also very interested in the um, inputs that we can get from the grapevine community. So uh, some months ago, we started a survey for um, retrieving information regarding needs, regarding what was the most important for the community, uh, for those who have, who have not yet um, registered or uh, answered this survey, here is the QR for accessing to this survey. We are still collecting um, data from all the information from the needs of the community to know the most important data types that we want to include in our portal. We have been very active also in social media. So we have a website at grapedia.org. Uh, and we also have a, a Twitter account, very active Twitter account, but we have even now gone further. And now we are also in um, Chinese social media. So we have also a YouTube channel and a Bilibili uh, channel for um, showing, for instance, uh, all the uh, video resources that we generate through this secret period. We have the dissemination video right now, and we will also have the recordings of this kickoff meeting. We also are present in, uh, in Twitter and WeChat, and we hope that the whole community can connect with us and uh, give us their inputs about the usefulness of the, of the database while the pilot, the demo, or the beta testing uh, will be available. Finally, we have been also 
highly in, active in disseminating our uh, project. So we have been uh, presenting the, um, the main objectives and the philosophy behind Repedia in annual meetings of the Construction Integrate, in uh, um, also in the Grapevine um, Breeding and Genetics meeting that was um, con uh, conducted this uh, um, July in uh, Landau in Germany. And we will also be present uh, in the PAC conference in San Diego on January next year. Finally, I would also like to present you the team. Uh, we will now give the, the, the time for uh, some of them to present themselves. The team is basically consisting uh, in people with the expertise in omics data generation and management, also in database portal construction. And we will also have people from the industry that are part of the team because we need to know uh, what are the main uh, um, necessities, needs from the industry as well. Uh, we also have people from um, the advisory board. So this is a very important um, part of our project. The advisory board um, consists in um, a highly expertise group of people who will help us uh, in decision making especially when it comes to implementation, to interface um, visualization, and how to reach also the entire Grapevine community. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Anne-Marie Digby, who is our SIG grant holder manager from the University of Verona. And she has been helping not only for the Grapevine implementation, but also in the integrate cost action. And all that we present here, uh, Mm, we owe to in, bring, in great part to, to Anne-Marie for, for her help in, in doing all the details and the, the management also with the university and, and the cost office. Um, I would like also to invite the whole Grapevine community uh, for uh, participating in the Grapevine project. We have created the figure of ambassadors. You are uh, formally invited to become ambassadors of Grapevine. The ambassadors will uh, have the, co uh, the commitment of giving full vis visibility to our project. And we already come with, uh, with um, important people uh, as ambassadors. And if you want to join us, uh, as an ambassador, please please write um, and uh, propose yourselves as ambassadors at Grapedia at Grapedia.org. Uh, I will now leave the stage to the team members, part of the team members that are present now to say hi and uh, introduce themselves. I can start if you want. <laughs> so, hi everybody. So I'm Camille Orstenholz. I'm uh, the vice chair of uh, the initiative, and I really like to to thank uh, Thomas for, and Anne Marie for all the efforts for putting this uh, very nice uh, event uh, uh, together. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be great. I'd like to thank everybody who is attending and the the SIG team who is uh, present. So to present myself, that, so I'm an um, associate professor at the Strasbourg University, and I'm um, my expertise is in um, grapevine genomics, and um, and I'm very happy to to be here, and uh, and my little girl here as well. <laughs> I leave the mic to anybody else. Thank you, Camille. Maybe now Jerome can. Uh... Yeah, we can go in the order on the on the slide feel that way. So um, hello everybody. I'm uh, I'm Chiron Grimplet uh, from uh, from Spain, from the city of uh, Aragon. Uh, I guess many of you know me already, and particularly in this uh, in the Grape Area project and, uh, and the C grant, I will be uh, responsible for the attribution of the STSM grant. And as I sent an email uh, earlier to uh, 
to all of you guys. Uh, it's very, very important uh, in this project that we are uh, discussing together uh, the feasibility or not, and if actually your project correspond to uh, to our object objective in a in a in in the Grabpedia. Like uh, Thomas showed in the presentation, they are very very specific and dedicated to the construction of the of the module. Uh, and that's it. Thanks uh, for the job uh, and Marie uh, and Thomas to, and uh, Sequencia to uh, to organize uh, this uh, this presentation. Thank you, Jerome. Marco. So good morning, everybody, and uh, and welcome to the Grapidia kickoff meeting. Um, my name is Marco Moreto. I work for the Fondazione Dum Mac in Italy. I'm a bioinformatician. I work in the computational biology group led by Claudio Donati, and uh, the Fondazione is located uh, in the north part of Italy, in San Michele Ladigi, and we mostly work uh, on grapevine, of course, and also apple. And um, my job as a computational biologist uh, mostly revolves around data analysis, uh, such as uh, transcriptomics uh, and genomic data analysis. Uh, and that's all. Thanks. Thanks, Marco. Uh, Aure, are you there? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Aureliano Bombarelli. I'm a professor in the SIC in the IBNCP in Spain. Uh, my focus is in bioinformatics and evolutionary genomics. And I have some experience of experience working in the soil genomic network database in the past and then developing new uh, software for databases like ECGDB that you will see in the in the in a presentation later. And yeah, I'm happy to be part of this team and thank you very much uh, and welcome. Thank you, Aureliano. Uh, yes, as Aure just mentioned, uh, he will have a presentation later on in the program, uh, as uh, the same as, as Marco. Um, the next one is Dario. Dario is not present right now, but he will join us in the afternoon. He also has a presentation about the grapegenomics.com portal. He comes from the University of California. Probably all of you know him very much. Uh, so we'll be also happy to hear him later on this afternoon. Later on, it's uh, Mariana. Hi everyone. So I'm Mariana Fazzoli. I'm um, an assistant professor at the University of Verona in Italy. Um, my research basically focuses on the molecular regulation of grape development. And I study that in relation to uh, the physiology of the vine, the environment and the cultural practices. And um, my work integrates omics standard and precision viticulture approaches. And I'm very happy to be part of the team and thank you everyone for the work and for participating to this meeting. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. Uh, the next one is Daniela Holgrave. Uh, Daniela is also not able to join us today, um, but he, she will be also uh, uh, watching the recordings later on. She's from Millifield University and also with a lot of expertise in, in genomics and transcriptomics in grapevine and other crop species. Now is the turn of Mikael. Hello, yes, I'm uh, Mikael Allo. I'm uh, working at INRAE in France in the team of Anne Francoise Adam Blondon. And um, I am the head of uh, INRAE uh, Plant Bioinformatics Facility. And also I'm uh, very implied in wheat, um, in wheat uh, bioinformatics and I am the chair of the WIT IS expert working group of the WIT initiative and I will talk more about my WIT experience this afternoon. Perfect, thank you Mikael. Uh, as he has mentioned, he also will present uh, this afternoon and we will be very excited to, to see uh, what has been achieved in, in WIT. Um, the following one is Pablo Carbonell Vejerano. He is also not able to, to assist now. Um, he reintegrated very recently the, again, the Institute of Grapevine and Wine Sciences in, in Spain. And his expertise is also in uh, long read sequencing for, for uh, grapevine genomes and transcriptomics and phenotyping as well. The following two uh, team members are from the industry and we are very happy to have them here. Uh, first, uh, Camille. Hello, everyone. 
So, I'm Camille Miaton. I'm from the, the Novatech uh, lab, which is part of the Mercier nursery in France, which is uh, the second biggest nursery in Europe. <clears throat> and I'm very happy to be part of this team and to, uh, to uh, have my, uh, my point of view uh, take, uh, take in, a, in account uh, in this pro project. Thanks. Thank you very much, Camille. <laughs> And finally, but not least, Walter. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am Walter Sanseverino from Sequencia Biotech. I am the CEO of the company, uh, but I have a scientific background. So I am a bioinformatician with a PhD in plant genetics. And my team and I, we are very happy to be part of this uh, Rapidia Consortium. And this afternoon, we will talk a little bit about how we can implement cloud solution to Rapidia services and community. So see you later, thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, so the team, uh, it's formed as you can see by people with, with a lot of expertise and a lot of ideas and, uh, and energy for doing uh, what we think. It's a very challenging task to integrate all the available resources and new resources that we want to generate and show them uh, on a single centralized portal. So thank to all of you. Um, everything regarding Rapidia has been uh, accomplished thanks to each one of, of the team who have already been very supportive and very helpful in, in the many meetings that we have got, uh, done uh, through this year. So um, from my side and Camille's side, we, we thank all of you for, for uh, participating and for having all these great energy in, in, in achieving this initiative. Um, I think that we, we now give uh, the stage to Anne-Marie, our C grant holder manager, uh, who will talk about the specific activities that we will offer um, to the entire community to join in the Grapedia uh, C grant period. Thank you, Thomas, and welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for joining this kickoff meeting. I'm pleased to announce that there are almost 100 people online right now. And um, yeah, from 40 different countries, which we're very excited to know about. Let me just share my screen. Okay. I hope you can see my presentation. Okay, so I am the grant holder manager for the Grapedia project. I belong to the University of Verona in Italy and the scientific representative of our, this Grapedia SIG is Professor Mario Pezzotti. Uh, like previously in the integrated cost action, we have several activities where we can advance and promote the goals of the Grapedia SIG. Uh, we plan to hold training schools. We will have short-term scientific missions. We will have working group meetings, whether they be virtual or hybrid or in presence. And we will also have a final meeting open to everybody and we will also be involved in dissemination activities for example the development of the Repedia website the publications and the possibility to hold workshops or talks or posters at international meetings so today I'd like to share with you some of the activities where we are looking for your participation the community participation so let's begin uh, we can start with short-term scientific missions. Let me just silence this. The short-term scientific missions, or we'll call them STSMs, they allow the scientists to learn from an institution or laboratory in another cost country. It's a concept of particular interest to young scientists like PhD students or postdocs. Um, researchers across Europe are working together currently to take advantage of this instru instrument and it shows it's so far showing impressive results in a short period of time 
For Gripedia, the STSM applications require a two-step evaluation procedure. Firstly, the applicant must fill out the Google form that's on our website. You can see the link before. And they must also email our STSM coordinator, Jerome Grimpler, to notify him of your interest. Accordingly, the evaluation of the proposal will depend on how well this proposal conforms to the goals of Gripedia, the academic background of the applicant, and also the budget available for this mission. Uh, the most suitable candidates will then be asked to submit their STSM application on the ECOS e portal. And uh, at this stage, we also want to tell you that the STSM coordinator and the SIG chair, they strongly encourage um, suitable applications from outlying EU and near neighbouring countries. Uh, for information regarding criteria, regarding eligibility, and also the, this application procedure, please have a look at the link at the bottom of the, of the screen. Oops, just a moment. The plan is to have two training schools during this 12-month period. The tailing, tailoring Repedia training school uh, will bring together trainers and trainees in order to build, evaluate, and validate the Repedia portal. This tailoring training school is planned to be held at Sequentia Biotech in Barcelona, Spain in March 2023. The host is our SIG team member, Walter Sanseverino, who's from uh, Sequentia Biotech. In the Tinkering with Gripedia training school, trainers will use this platform to instruct trainees on the use of the portal, as well as to train potential stewards or curators. This tinkering training school will be held at Fondazione Mac in Trento, Italy, in June 2023. The host of this uh, event is the SIG team member, Marco Moretto, who is from Fondazione Mac. Just to let you know that the calls for trainees for either training school will be announced via email and also on the training school page of the Gripedia website. We will include the criteria for eligibility and this will also be available online and it will need to be addressed in your application. Once again, we strongly welcome suitable applications from outlying EU countries and near neighbouring countries. Moving on, the final meeting uh, will hopefully showcase the Gripedia portal to the entire Grapevine community. And as a result, all are welcome to attend this event. Uh, the meeting is planned to be held in Valencia, Spain in early September, 2023. The host is our SIG chair, Thomas Martus. Thomas is from I2SIS Bio. Further information will be uh, on the arriving via email and also on the Gripedia website, uh, where there'll also be registration information as well. We have a lot of ways to keep in touch. There are many contacts and there are many social links as well. Of course, there's our website, which you must save in your browser because it is frequently updated. There is always new information on this website. Uh, the email addresses to contact us for specific inquiries or maybe a request to join a mailing list. We also have Twitter. We have a YouTube channel. We have a Facebook page. And we're also very proud to be of global level because we've also entered into Chinese uh, social media where we are um, going to be able to put this uh, um, kickoff meeting and the video, et cetera, also on Billy Billy and also on WeChat. So uh, we're looking forward to a very, very international participation. Okay, that's all from me. Uh, I think at this stage, we can safely send everyone off for a lunch break. What do you think, Thomas? Yeah, it's, uh, we are in perfect timing, actually. Okay. Um, according to the program, we should come back 
uh, for the first block after lunch. And if you have any questions on this first part, you can, you can make uh, your uh, questions in the Q&A section here and we can answer them at the beginning of the next block, right? Once That's again, right. I would like to thank Anne-Marie. Uh, you have been very, very important in, in, in establishing uh, the first steps of this of this project and and your helpful um, your very helpful um, way of, of of doing things uh, has been very important for everything to be so successful. So thank you once again. Thank you everyone who have joined uh, this first block. Uh, I know that some people might be sleeping still uh, in their countries, but uh, hopefully they will join us in the afternoon. Uh, as I told you, these sessions will be recorded and very soon they will be uploaded in, in the social media um, platforms. So um, even after this uh, kickoff meeting ends, we will be happy to answer questions uh, and to collect data or information from your interest in participating in, in Repedia. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Camille, uh, our vice chair. Um, also, the project uh, it's, uh, has been accomplished thanks to you, and I uh, hope that we have a lot of uh, activities and brainstorming for this challenging task. Uh, we'll also like to thank the, the, the SIG team and our panelists today who will present some of their um, research that it's in complete um, alliance with the Greatpedia portal. So once again, thank you all. Thanks to the sponsors and see you this afternoon. The talk will start precisely at two o'clock. So please try to re-enter earlier, five, 10 minutes earlier. Thank you very much. See you this afternoon, bye.
Okay, can I uh, share my screen now? Okay, so can I can I start? Let's wait just a couple of minutes. Okay. And um, I will briefly introduce the, the afternoon session and then we go with you. Okay. Thank you, Miguel. So, Michael, uh, this is Marco here. I will help you out uh, with the um, uh, question and answers. Okay, so if there are, if, if someone has questions and they will uh, write it down, I, I will read it out for you if you okay, want. Thank you. <laughs> I will monitor that. Very well. So just to keep up with the, with the program, we are in the afternoon session of our Grapedia kickoff meeting. Uh, for those who were on the morning session, um, thank you for, for attending and hope that you got inspired with the, with the presentation of the project, uh, the team, and our ongoing activities. We really hope that you will be interested in participating through the activities that we will offer through the uh, seed grant period, uh, these first 12 months that started uh, the 1st of November this year. And now we would like to um, uh, introduce the next round of speakers that will present um, their results or their experience in, in database constructions in other species than, than grapevine. I would like to remind you that if you have questions, please write them in the Q&A uh, section of the, of the Zoom platform. Marco Moreto, who is the moderator of uh, this first block, will, um, uh, will answer and, and will also uh, tell the, the questions to, to the panelists. Uh, once again, thank you all of you for making Rapidia the start of Rapidia possible. I hope that you are all very excited as we are. And please, uh, the stage is all yours, Mikael. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm uh, Mikael Allo. I'm uh, working uh, at Inrae France in the team of Anne-Françoise Adam uh, Blondon. Uh, my background is more uh, with bioinformatics. Um, nowadays, I'm the head of the INRAE plant bioinformatics facility, and I am also chair of the WIT IS expert working group of the WIT initiative. So uh, my talk will be a feedback from uh, the WIT com community. So I will uh, start to present you the WIT initiative, and after that, the WIT uh, Information System Expert Working Group. And uh, I will also um, share with you some experience about data st standards and data discovery. So the WIT in in initiative. 
So the, the, the WIT initiative was proposed by a researcher and a funding org organization uh, from several countries. Uh, it was endorsed by the G20 agricultural uh, min uh, ministers and it's uh, starting in uh, 2011. So it's uh, more than 10 years ago. So the challenging and vision of this in, in, in initiative, the, the challenges are that the uh, world production um, is not meeting the necessary uh, future de de demand. For, for example, uh, we, we see about it that the, um, the uh, food demand will increase by 60% um, uh, by 2050 while the yields are uh, still stagnating. And also another challenge is that wheat is uh, particularly susceptible to uh, climate change, I think, as, as some other um, plants. So the vision of the wheat, of the wheat initiative was to support the uh, development of a global uh, research com com community with public and private sector to share resources, data, uh, and uh, knowledge. And the goal is to improve the wheat productivity, quality, and uh, sustainable production. So we updated uh, the wheat initiative strategic research agenda recently, and um, there is now a, a publication uh, with all the um, main ideas developed of this strategic research agenda. So feel free to, to look at this uh, publication. About the WIT initiative organ organization, there is uh, some uh, coordinating committee, research committee, and scientific board that help to um, coordinate the expert wo uh, working groups. So, uh, our working group is here, he's a WIT IS expert uh, working group, but as, as you see, there is also uh, other uh, expert working group on the different uh, topics of, uh, of uh, interest about uh, your biotic stresses, phenotyping, breeding, quality, germplasm, uh, nutrients, uh, pet genomics, ag agronomy, and so on and so on. So now I will uh, talk uh, more deeply on the WIT Information System Expert Working Group. So um, uh, a paper de de uh, dedicated to how the uh, WIT Information uh, System uh, community was built has been uh, published. So um, I recommend you to look at, at it. I, I will just highlight some uh, the big the big uh, parts of this uh, paper. So this paper describes how we built this expert uh, working group. Also, um, how we co collaborate by seeking help from other com communities. For, for, for example, we have a joint action with uh, with our RDA group, and I will talk about that in the data standard part of my pre presentation. We also perform a, lo a, lo a lot of uh, surveys to, to un understand the needs of the community. And um, the WIT uh, found us for uh, meetings to have a regular me meetings in this expert uh, working group. We also build around a, a, a successful uh, uh, result result which which is the data discovery tool that I will also present you after and also uh, a lot of work on the outreach so here is the uh, um, with IS expert working group website it's quite an old-fashioned website so we'll We'll have to update it to have some uh, thing more modern, like for uh, Grepedia. But what we can see is that we have some um, 
some tabs on this uh, on this uh, website. The first one is the, the description of the expert to working group and the, and the goal, linked to our uh, Twitter feed and also linked to our uh, help desk uh, email. The collaborator uh, tab presents all the expert to working group uh, member. The search tab here is the data discovery tool that I will pre present you after. Data st uh, 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 standard also, I will pre present it ju just after. The submit data part here is a link to a tool to allow uh, the people to submit their uh, data on uh, uh, Dataverse. Uh, this tool has not be, been developed a lot and is not uh, very used by the community because uh, I think the community have, have already some databases and some repository to submit the, the, uh, the data. So for, for it, uh, it was not a, a need. And also here, uh, we list here all the tools useful uh, to do some with bi uh, uh, bioinformatics bi and links to all the description of the uh, databases and so on and so on. So now I will um, talk more deeply about data standards. So the WIT initiative expert working group um, work in a joint action with the uh, research data a la Al, 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 Alain's group. And uh, we uh, write a, a paper to uh, detail what has been done in this, in this group. So I will also just um, highlight some uh, points here and I recommend you to uh, look at the paper. So the, the first point is uh, how we build on existing a standard on uh, the practices. What is important is to have a clear view what is existing and what should be uh, re uh, recommended. We also have, have a discussion to converge toward the re recommendation about which standard uh, to use for which uh, use uh, cases. We also have some dissemination using a web website and also we uh, put all our uh, ontologies on a dedicated uh, portal, which is Agro uh, Portal. And also we work on the adoption on these uh, guidelines by different com communities. So yeah, 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 is the, the website of the, uh, the guideline with some um, inter, inter, interesting uh, pages, uh, pages on the different uh, uh, the guidelines on the different format and standard to use for sequence variation, genome annotation, phenotypes, germplasm, gene expression, and physical maps. We also uh, linked all the ontologies and uh, vocabularies uh, used by the community. And also we uh, describe some uh, typical uh, uh, use cases and which um, standards uh, to, to use. Okay, so now, so now I, will, I will talk about the uh, more uh, central tool of the uh, developed by the uh, WIT uh, IS expert working group, which is the WIT IS data discovery tool. So it's, this tool is a federated data portal, which allowed to search all the metadata in all the databases we the databases around, 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 around the world. In the US, in Europe, in Australia, also we have some data from Japan, uh, from CIMIT, so it's, it's more um, uh, Latin American and also con uh, the countries. So we have this one generic uh, uh, portal, we search the metadata and then to have links to the databases. So here is uh, uh, the list of the, of the repositories and all the number of data indexed by this uh, tool. So as you see, there is a lot of data index in our own infrastructure at, at INRAE, but also at EBI, uh, in uh, Germany at IPK, PGSB, in the, in, the, in the US at Grameen, T3, uh, Green Genes, and so on and so on. So I will um, present you a very uh, quick behind the scene of what 
uh, what is this tool in terms of uh, um, development stack? I'm not the expert uh, of the uh, development part, but I can uh, present you the, the big, the big uh, overview. So we have all these uh, international databases and uh, we take some uh, different data sources from these uh, 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 databases. It could be CSV files, it could be direct access to, uh, to uh, SQL databases, to RDF um, uh, files, also to solar uh, distributed uh, file, or tools like Intermine or uh, JBros. And we use uh, extract, transform, and load tool to modify the, uh, this data in JSON files, following a very simple model that is the name of the entry, the node, which is the name of the uh, um, of the uh, um, partner, the database name, the uh, description of this entry, and a backlink which is the uh, URL, which is the backlink to the uh, resources. And then an, uh, a description of the different uh, pieces. And we centralize all these uh, files in a centralized index using the Elasticsearch um, uh, uh, NoSQL database. And we also add some uh, en enrichment in this uh, index following, for example, some synonyms, uh, following some ontologies and, some, and, and, and so on. So it could allow to make a search. It's kind of Google-like uh, 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 search tool, and it will give you some uh, uh, results. So for, for example, here we search from spelt, and it will have matches with a uh, Tudico Matibum Spelta, but also to have a match with Epote, which is a French name of this species. So about, about the JSON uh, data exchange uh, uh, format, we describe all the fields uh, 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 needed. It's very, very simple mod model. So it's very easy for all uh, the uh, databases to provide us this, uh, this uh, information this meta metadata. So I will um, show you two simple use uh, cases you know, using this tool. So for, 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 for example, so you have here at the, at the, at the left, all, the, all the, the name of the databases and the, uh, and the description of the, the data. Here in the more uh, tab, you have all the, all the legal mention, the help, how to join us, and so on and so on. So here you have auto completion. So for, for, for example, you are, you are interested to search on your favorite uh, mar marker, which is CFD2. So you tab CFD and you have the list of the um, indexed files. So if you choose C CFD2, it will show you all the uh, matches uh, search in CFD2 in the uh, description of all the uh, uh, metadata in all the uh, databases. So here you can have some uh, filters. For example, you can have uh, select by uh, data types to have filters on denotation or on uh, literature. You could have also uh, additional filter on selecting the the database. For, for for example, here I selected the open-minded databases to have only the bibliography match. And after that, you have your your list of results, and you 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 can easily click on the link here to open the backlink to the uh, database. So for, for, uh, for example here, it's open a, a JBrowse directly focus on this CFD2 uh, ma uh, 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 marker. And if I click on the, um, the gene, which is just near the, the, the marker, you will have all the uh, information. I think it's a bit like um, in the grape uh, browser. And you could have also have a backlink to the uh, WITIS uh, data, that, data discovery here with the name of the gene. And here you will have the results of this uh, 
gene search in uh, the WITIS data uh, uh, discovery. So for, for example, here there is a match in the uh, NetMiner tool, which is allow, 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 allow you to display all the, uh, the uh, network around this, this gene. So it's a, a database in the uh, UK at Ro Rosenstedt Research. Also, there is a link here of this uh, gene in ensemble plants. Uh, if I select here the uh, bibliography uh, 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 filter, I have a link to a publication uh, who has a reference with the CFD2 marker. Here is another ex example using uh, a more uh, general search. For example, we are searching on yield. So I search the yield and I will have a lot of a lot of results in the WITIS data discovery tool. For example, a link to a publication in uh, the CIMIT repository. Also link to the uh, Japanese uh, Komugi uh, gene catalog. Here I can uh, select the match in uh, grain genes and select, for example, the genetic map data type to have a link of this uh, genetic map with a QTL about a yield. I can filter also, for example, uh, by uh, database. Here I can select the 2DC toolbox uh, that database in the uh, US and have all the YID results in this uh, uh, database. So for example, I can click here on a genotyping exp exp experiment link to have the description of a, a genotyping uh, uh, data, or here it's a link to the phenotyping exp experiments in, in the uh, T3 database. Also, I, I select here uh, the uh, Gramin dat, uh, database to uh, show you some link on the Gramin uh, website um, with uh, re which re reference yield. So um, now after this short demo, I will show you about the last features that we develop and put in a, a production. We develop an, auto, an ontology and an annotation which allow us to link the, the literature with the phenotyping ex, experimental uh, 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 data. And now we uh, actually we work on a corpus of uh, more than 1,000 um, with open access uh, publication and we use uh, the uh, we trait onto ontology to do the, the text mining. We also add uh, uh, an URL dereferencing de which al al allow you to um, to have some um, bookmark of your uh, precise search. And uh, as I explained you a bit earlier, we add some synonym arrangement, which allow you to not have only exact matches on your search, but also some uh, synonyms. So for, for, for example, if you search icon wheat, it will also match triticum mono, 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 monocum, which is a more uh, generic name. Uh, the last feature we add is an automatic um, addition of the breeding app API data sources. So now the tool is uh, compliant with the breeding API. Uh, I will show you just two small pages. Here is the um, the, the how to join a page, which uh, explain how to, how, to, how to be part of this uh, of this uh, uh, portal, uh, um, how to give your your uh, metadata to us, and so on and so on. And about the perspective on the uh, on this tool, uh, next year we plan to have to add some um, monitoring on the uh, traffic on the on the tool and also to uh, display the data of last update to be sure that the data are, uh, are uh, up to date. And the more long-term uh, uh, 
perspective is to extend the ontology and man manotation to allow some more complex uh, uh, searches like exact, exact uh, uh, phrases and also to give the possibility to uh, download the, the, uh, the result onto, uh, onto a new uh, sources like uh, sources following the bioschema.org annotation. So to conclude, I will just show, show, uh, show you so that it's, it, is, it, is, it is possible to go beyond the, the, the with IS because we use the same code to develop a more generic tool, which is FEDER in, in the frame of the European Infrastructure for Life uh, Science. So this FEDER is like an extension of the WITIS with all plant uh, uh, data available. So it's kind of the same tool, but it will short search in um, all the plant databases, not only the wheat uh, de uh, uh, databases. So for, for example, here I, I, I give you a print screen and I, uh, I selected the Vitis taxon group to have all the Vitis results uh, available in this uh, FEDER tool. As you, as you see here, there is not a lot of databases available available, there is uh, our uh, URGI uh, databases on some ensemble, ensemble plants and also EV, EVA and uh, metal crop. But it is very easy uh, for, it, for us to add new uh, resources, for, for, uh, for example, of VTS uh, databases around, around the world. And uh, to conclude, I will I want to acknowledge the uh, URGI team, all the uh, WITIX expert working group, and also all the uh, data providers. We uh, gave us all the uh, metadata to uh, to fill this this, uh, this tool. So thank you, and uh, now I will await your questions. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for a nice talk, Michael. We have uh, a raised hand from uh, Jerome. I don't know, Jerome, if you can speak or write down your question. No, no, sorry, I, uh, I didn't pay attention and uh, it was, I don't know, I ended up uh, clicking on the, the raised hand. Okay, so there are no questions at the moment, but I actually, I have a lot of questions, Michael, because it's really, really interesting. And the first one, it's, uh, uh, it's related to private data. So in the beginning, you were talking about uh, uh, public and private. So I was wondering uh, how you deal within the the WIT IS uh, with private data. So yeah, okay. If there yeah. is some if uh, people can access it, if there is some sort of restriction, because I I can imagine that within uh, the WIT community, there's a lot of uh, private interest. I guess. Yes, it's a very good uh, 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 question. So I, I um, the public-private uh, data it's more for the for the World Wheat Initiative. So there is some private uh, partners in the different expert uh, working group, but for our case in the Wheat IS expert uh, working group and the Wheat IS data discovery tool, we, we we work only with open access uh, 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 data. So no no pri private data in this tool. It's like uh, Google. So only only open 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 access. Thanks a lot. So we have a question from uh, Thomas. Um, thanks, Marco. Um, Michael, it was uh, a really really nice presentation. I think that we have a lot of uh, things to learn from the WIT community, and uh, we are really happy to have you on board. Actually. Um, I see that the, the WIT information system uh, integrates so many different levels of information, right? It's not only biological data, but goes beyond that. And the way how it's connected, I think that we can really learn uh, and, and try to apply it in, in, in our uh, species of interest. My, my questions were basically two, more open related to, um, since this is an international network, how was it funded, basically? Was it internationally uh, applied to different funding sources uh, or it's uh, run by um, own local uh, funding support? 
Yeah, so, um, the, the, the we initiative give, give to the expert uh, working group only fundings for meetings. I think a, a bit like a cost action, uh, but uh, to for the development of the tools and uh, so on, we we rely on local uh, fund, fund, uh, uh, fundings. So uh, the with the with initiative uh, can give uh, su support later and so on, but not funding for the development. I see. And and my last question is: How did you integrate it, or how did you? Uh, connected with the community? Did you have any um, special location for which the WIT community, researchers, industry may have learned how to use the WIT information system platform? Okay, so for the WIT IS, we have some trainings. We have some, in general, online uh, trainings, one or two per, per year. And also, um, we, we met uh, in person at PAG. We have um, we have a, a short uh, annual meeting at of the with IS expert working group at, at PAG, uh, which is open to the community. So perhaps we will uh, we will uh, see together at at PAG, and I and it could be also inter interesting if you can attend to the with IS expert working group me meeting also. I can send you the the the, the dates. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, actually, uh, Aureliano is going to attend the PAC meeting uh, next year uh, on behalf of the Great Pedia uh, initiative. So maybe we can also get some uh, important insights from, from the other communities. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Aureliano? Um, yeah, I have a, a quick question. I think that, first of all, Mikael is a really, really nice tool. So are you thinking at some point, because how I see this kind of a Google-like tool you know, that you can search, at some point are you thinking to have some kind of a basket where you can store data, let's say, for example, a list of uh, gene IDs or sequences that you can insert uh, in one of these uh, web page or tools that you have affiliated. In other words, can you take, for example, one sequence from Grameen and take it into uh, any of these other affiliated uh, tools? Or is something that, uh, do you think that from, for, because they are very different databases, it's kind of impossible? Yeah, no, it's not possible to have all, what, what can be done and we are, we want to to, to that is to have some uh, downloads of the uh, result with uh, the with some list of IDs on or also 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 on in um, standard uh, formats and, and it will be easier to do that using the the breeding API uh, the standard so now we just implemented uh, this uh, uh, breeding API uh, the sources so now we will be able to have this uh, download uh, in standardized uh, the format. And when we have this this download, we'll have to use this uh, gene ID list to do something, but it will be outside the, the WITIS uh, tool. It, we, the idea is to have a lot of data, but it's just to find, to find data. That's the goal of the, of the, of the, of the tool. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think that this was clear. Thanks. Okay, so I saw from the question and answer, we have no other question from the attendees. In any case, feel free to ask your question, writing it down, and then uh, we will forward the question to the uh, to the panelists, to the speaker. And uh, okay, now I leave the stage to Aura. It's up to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, let me share the screen. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much uh, to give me this opportunity. Uh, one small disclaimer, uh, even if I have been involved in this project, the hands of, of this tool is uh, Noor Fernandez, as you will see at the end of, of, the, of the presentation. So uh, first of all, like a little small introduction about myself. Uh, I'm a professor at the SIC in the IBNCP in Valencia. My expertise are, for one side, a little bit about bioinformatics, genomics, creating tools, and in the other side, evolutionary genomics, trying to see how genomes evolve. 
So the idea of the thing that I'm going to present today is, uh, comes from uh, Noé Fernández and I. We, at some point, we share a common, uh, a common job. That is, we were working at the SGN database, the Solanasi database, together for several years. And when both of us, we left uh, the SGN database at some point, uh, of course, we, we needed to involve in creating other databases for the communities. Uh, but about this idea of trying to do something uh, more simple, no? Databases can be very, very complicated. So the idea that I'm going to present today was come from, from this, no? Sitting both of us together and saying, no, we need to do something more simple because otherwise it would be impossible to develop these uh, resources for small communities. So, um, okay, let me see if I can, okay, so yeah. So I have a small introduction about trying to set up uh, the framework uh, for this, and then get to be a little bit about what we learned about all these years about developing databases, and then why we are starting to work with uh, ECGDB and what ECGDB is. So the first thing that we need to understand is Complex organisms are very, very complicated in terms of, of data. No, we have uh, storing the information as DNA, so we have genes, of course, but also we have transposable elements in these uh, genomes. We may have just for one gene, or I mean one organism, so several organisms. No, and we are thinking in point in, from the point of view, for example, in something like Arabidopsis, we will have around thirty-four thousand genes. We are thinking about rice around. 56,000 genes, and that is just for one organism. And that is not all. We have genes, but then they are express and they they have transcripts, and the transcript may have different level of expression, and then they are translated to proteins that also they are regulated at some point, and we synthesize compounds, and we produce phenotypes, and this happens somewhere and at some point on time, and also you have interaction with other organisms. And from a database point of view, of course, we will wish to, to keep all this data together, but as you can imagine, it's something very, very complex. So for databases, for genomic databases for now, we are trying to have different layers of data. No? The most common ones are in genomics, so we are trying to store uh, markers, for example, genome sequences, annotations, or even variation in terms of BCF files sometimes, or so things that you can see in a browser sometimes. Now we are jumping in the field of pan genomes. That is also a very good way to visualize uh, variation. Also, we have transcriptomics. And from the, that point of view, we can have simple rna data or expression data, but also we can complicate things again. We can have regulatory networks. We can have clusters to visualize the data. Proteomics, again, we can have protein tags, but we can have protein expression, uh, protein uh, content levels. In metabolomics, we can have the composition of, 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 of compounds. We can have different levels of compounds, also that embed in metabolic networks. And of course, some phenotypic data. And as you can imagine, this is a huge amount of data that we want to integrate in databases. No? So it's, it's kind of a big problem that we have here. Um, and databases, of course, trying to store this data, we try to elaborate some structure. So the thing that you can see here was the design that we did long time ago in 2010, so more than 10 years ago, about the SGN database. And, as, and in one side, you have the user the, the, that, that access to this data through a web interface. And in the other side, we have the data. And between the user and the data, of course, you have several layers of codes. No? So you, in our case, we are all programmers, so we program in Perl all these things. And when we have some Mason components, we have the SQL database that they store all this information together. We also have external files like FASTA, GFF, and so on, and some tools that integrate everything. So just keep in mind that trying to integrate all this data together was a very complex uh, situation. But the, the product that we were able to deliver at the time, and we start the, the, the SGN database still delivered, is a database that you can access through a, a, a web interface that you can see here with different tools, and, 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 and you can navigate through genomes or maps, genetic maps, you can search terms and so on. And of course, it's interesting because this data that you have here is accessible to different communities, not, not, not only to scientists, but also to some growers, farmers, breeders, and also even some, some teachers from uh, uh, an outreach proposition too. No? So, so a database is also an important thing that we need to think not only in the data that is contained, but also in the community that is addressing too. 
So what is the thing that we learned, uh, Noel and I, when we were working in the SDN databases? Well, the first is when we attempt to develop a database, the first is that databases are driven by community. So you don't have a community behind the database. It doesn't make sense, no? And we are trying to address some needs. So, so as, 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 uh, uh, so as we said before, you don't have a community that is uh, reinforcing these databases. They're asking for some needs. The databases don't make sense. But also we need to think the needs in two different ways. One of them is the usage. Okay, the different tools that we are implementing, the different uh, visualization that, that the people can access, the community can access, and of course the contents. And there are two different things. One of them involves uh, the development of, of some pieces of software, some applications, and the other involves data curation. So that is uh, one thing that is important here. When we are thinking in the software to develop new applications, new models to add to the databases, uh, it's necessary to think in three things. No, they need to be easy to maintain because you don't want to create a database that now or some piece of software now that in six months or two years down the road, when you update some of the libraries that you are using, it doesn't work anymore. So need to be easy to maintain, easy to understand because probably the people that is going to work in the database today, they are going to follow their careers and move, move to other places. So the new people need to understand what is happening. No? And it's one, one lesson that we get from the SDN is that SDN started in 2004, if I don't remember bad. And when we are right there, was a lot of spaghetti code. No, You find some pieces of code that was kind of ancestral that no one knew why it was there. And of course, you cannot touch it because some part of the database will fall if you touch it. And also, it's, it's important to add new pieces. That this is to add new pieces. If you want to add a new implementation, a new, for example, you want to add proteomic data, this should be, should, should be able to add it in an easy way. So in, in some ways, we need to summarize this. Any, any code, and especially in databases, you need to have a good documentation, easy to update, a solid testing. If something is changed, it should be easy to detect what is the error. Uh, modularity that you can add new new models, new applications in an easy way. And if one of them fail, it doesn't fail the rest of the system. And also simplicity, and simplicity is essential. No, more complex that you have, more easy that is going to find the the bugs, find the errors, and to maintain the database. So it's the other thing that we learn it here. And then, and then, of course, the other side is not usage, is not application, is the content. And, and of course, the content of the database need to, need to be created and updated. And this can be done in two ways. No? You have for one side the community and you can ask the community to help with this curation. Sometimes you can have uh, workshops where the, the community uh, can help you with this curation, some hackathons that pe people can add it. As the, uh, Desi and did, for example, you can nominate uh, data curators in, in, in the community that we can they can help you to create the data and of course you have people also that are present in the database the data curators that are that can be uh, working in the database and at the, at the end it's a balance but, but keep in mind that have a database without data is not useful and be able to add data and, and keep these things updated it involves a lot of time and resources. No? Of course, if you have a tomato database and you don't have the last version of the tomato genome that someone published a few months ago or the last version of the pan genome, you are losing some of this usability. So it's essential being able to integrate everything. So here it's important that from the point of, of view of, of the code, it's easy to add new data, okay? So it's, it's important that uh, all the implementation that we have here is easy to add new data if, if something pop up and that can be created. So this comes from the idea that, that, that for the ECGDB. And the ECGDB system is not something new. So there are other systems that can do something like that. This is a table that from, from the publication of the ECGDB in which we would like to compare with other uh, tools that, that integrate this genomic data. And the ones that I want to just uh, highlight is Clipal because Clipal is a really good tool. So Clipal is a tool that you can download it, you can install in your computer and you can create your genomic database. You have a lot of modules that you can integrate and at the end some databases like the Rosasi database are based in, in Clipal. But the problem of Clipal, and this is the thing that when we started this idea of ECGDB, ECGDB didn't start from, from scratch, was something like, okay, let's try to create an avocado database or an olive database with Clipal and it took us too, too much time, okay? 
Uh, you see here a screenshot of the different content the user guide, and even in the most simple cases, you need you need a lot of time to to be able to install all the modules, and not all of them are compatible. Sometimes it's difficult to upload the data inside the database. So at some point we we realized, Noah and I we realized that we needed to do something different for our, our own needs that and the needs of these small communities that we were working, like the olive community or the avocado community. So. We pop up with this idea that uh, we needed something, some alternative, and, and we put this goal. We needed to do in an after. We need to do some software that if you have some knowledge about bioinformatics, then you are not an expert, you should be able to sit in front of your computer with your data and create your genomic database in one after. And for that, need to be easy to install, need to be easy to maintain. And also we wanted to use this for different communities. So it needed to be useful for the development of multiple instances that we could do it in uh, not only just for, for Olive, but also for other uh, communities and, and, and plants and systems. And this is where uh, ECGDB pop up. So Noé Fernandez came to my um, laboratory when I was in Italy and he stayed there for one, one year virtually. Um, and we started to, to work in this idea. And as I said, most of the code, all, all of the code that you see here, all the development come from, from, from him. No, I just was the, the doctor to say, we need to do it in one afternoon. Okay, so what is the thing that we have about ECGDB? The implementation. So ECGDB is a Docker installation. Docker is essential now in bioinformatics because it allows you to move everything in containers and be able to install in any system in a very easy way. So one of the requirements that we needed is that needed to be a Docker machine easy to install in, in any, system. Inside Docker, you have Apache, an Apache server and possibly SQL and PHP that are the three part essentials for the code. Then all the annotation databases are in a very simple PostgreSQL schema. We try to keep this, the database schema as simple as we can. And then do you have this PHP uh, front end with CSS, JavaScript, jQuery, or any other, depending of, of, the, of the different applications, that is the, the front end, the, the thing that we see in the, in the web when we connect to these databases. About sequences, one thing that we did is we decided that some databases store the sequences and a lot of data in, uh, in, the, in the database itself, like in a PostgreSQL table, but we thought that this is not scalable. So the idea here is that we store everything in, in files and the system is able to access to these files that they are indexes. So for example, in the case of sequences, they are indexed by BLAST and then they are easy to retrieve them uh, through the, the, the system. And then you have this JSON file uh, that, con that control the metadata uh, customization of the database. What is the thing that you can find right now in ECGDB? That is the features that we have. So for the ECGDB, for example, the first thing that we wanted to add is a file download. No, we want to have a place that the community can go there and download the files, the annotation files, sequence file, list of genes, etc. And the thing is that the the, the structure that you see here in the download files is the same structure that we have in the in the in the in the Docker inside the Docker. So when we add the data, it's following the same structure. No, so that you can see here. So it's very easy to to to, to have kind of the symmetry between how you store the files and how the, this database is reading. So if you have here a new folder with a new file, it will appear automatically in the, in the database. And of course, only the, the administrator can do that, but that simplifies a lot to add new data. Then we wanted to, to have the, this, this data that is easy to download. No? So of course the system can read the, 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 the files, can index the files, and if someone is looking, for example, for some gene term, it will appear a list, and then the system can copy the list and, and sort the list and even download the list, as we will see in some screenshot. Of course, we have integrated genome browser, so we were, are able to navigate the genome from one place to another, looking for more favorite genes or favorite annotations, variance data, for example, we will have some BCF file uh, uploaded, and even some transcriptomic data uh, also that can be integrated in, in, in JBrowser. Also we have an integrated BLAST tool. That is something that uh, this idea come from, from also to, to the SDN database. And again, we have uh, the databases are automatically detected. We have the databases in some directory in this system. So if we have a new database, the system automatically add to the, to the menu here. 
And of course you have the list of genes. So once you have the hits, you can click the list of genes and you should be able to find it. We built this in the way that we don't have temporary files. And also we have this classic and tabular format uh, that is able to, to, we are able to read it and uh, to download it in an easy way too. And of course, as I mentioned before, you can have a list of genes uh, that then you can copy and download them as, a, as an Excel file. That is also some, some people in our community ask for this simple tool. So it's uh, something that we did too. Each of the genes has their own uh, gene ID page, like in many databases, and these uh, have integration, for example, from the genome browser. We have functional descriptions and sequences that, that the user can, can access. And the thing that the system is, is doing is taking all these different places from different files. So in some ways, the, the, the Postgre is telling the system where are these files, and the system then is taking these, these files from this uh, information from different files. Uh, bulk search and download it is something that we can that this that the system can do too. And right now this has a very simple expression atlas that you have some file and you can say okay so give me the expression for this list of genes so you put it here and then you are able to extract the tables or whatever uh, you you put it there. We are uh, Noel now is working a more complex version of this but this is also one of these uh, features that we have now. Of course. We wanted to do things easy, so you have two ways to access to the hub and to the information. One of them is through the GitHub uh, repository. So here you have all the instructions, how you can download this, how you can install it, and everything else. And also, uh, Noe did an excellent job doing several videos in YouTube where he's explaining step by step how you can integrate uh, these databases. And now some examples that I want to, 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 to mention about these systems. So. For example, we have this olive tree DB that we have the, when we did work, we work in the olive genome, we needed the database. Uh, so we did this olive tree DB. And also we have a mango based DB. Originally the mango base was based in the SGN system, but uh, at some point, uh, Noe took over and so migrate all the data that, that was in the SGN system to uh, the, the, the ACG DB system. And, I think that he did it in a couple of afternoons too. We have the Persea base that also store all the uh, this new uh, avocado genome information that we have. And, and of course, at some point I say, okay, so let's try to do this with uh, grip. So I asked uh, one member of, of, of my team, Victor, to say, okay, Victor, can you use ESCGDB to create a grape uh, database with the genome and all these things together? And the requirement is you need to do it in an afternoon because otherwise we will not be able to do it. Uh, uh, and he did it, no? So he took the, 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 this information, I think if I don't remember from, uh, he took the data from uh, Ensemble, I think, and he uploaded it and yeah, here you can see some example of the files. And then the, he also put all the information in Genome Browser so you can navigate through all the different genes. Uh, and these are the tools that you can find it. And also, uh, of course, we didn't have data at that point, but also I asked uh, Victor to test this uh, beta version that Noe did about gene expression. So you can see for some genes expressions or some different profiles that you may be able to have for a gene. Of course, this is not real data. It's some tests that, that Victor did. And also with some uh, expression cards that also Noe added to the system to visualize expression with different icons or different images, I, I will imagine. Okay, so that is all. As I mentioned before, all the credits for this work is for Noe. I'm just the guy giving him problems saying we need this. Uh, Noe has own, his own group now in Malaga. He uh, has his own group based, uh, that is working in databases. And, and, and of course, Victor was also involved creating this uh, uh, grape. Uh, that database uh, in one afternoon. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Aure, for the very inspiring and, and nice talk. Uh, for the moment, uh, we have no question from uh, the attendees. So I see a raised hand from Tomas. Please, Tom. Uh, thanks, Marco. Um, Aure, indeed, as, as Marco said, very inspiring. I think that uh, the future of, of genome databases is that in the, uh, in, 
people who work on them and now it's so easy to generate your own genome sequence right of the cultivar or the organism that you're studying uh, people will be able to upload their own genomes right so um, i know that for instance the grape genomics of Port portal has offered the possibility to upload the the genomes of anybody who would like to include their genomes there but having also this tool is very nice because then you can also uh, have different sources for integrating later on, for instance, in Graypedia, different genome browsers, gen different genome accessions of different cultivars and, and uh, organisms of interest. Um, so do, do you think that this could be the way in which um, in the future researchers will have to work? Like you work on a cultivar, you sequence your own genome and you upload it in your own portal? So one, one of the things that we want to implement with um, ECGDB is trying to be able to have your own instance as, that you can install it, but the instance can, communi can communicate between them. So it's like, uh, I, I don't know if every one of you, for example, now with uh, the problem of Twitter, you did an account in Mastodon. Now you have, uh, so everyone can install their own Mastodon instance in a server, but all the instances are communicating between them. So the idea of the future of ECGDB is that if we have an easy system that we can install, for example, for an avocado or tomato or, 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 or grape or whatever you want it, that still all these instances can communicate between them and you can do a blast and, and, and move the information from one place to another if all of them have the same thing. So Thomas, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that it's a possibility. So we have to, to there are two, only two possible models. A centralistic model, in which if I have, you have a, one database to rule them all, or you have a federated model in which you have instances that can communicate between them. And of course, the second one uh, could be more difficult to implement because it's difficult to implement communication between instances. But I think that, yeah, it probably could be the future. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, I think that we we shared that uh, view in, in the way that maybe we could uh, implement it in, in Grapidia. Um, thanks, uh, Aure. Actually, I also have a question, Aure. Yeah. It's more it's uh, more technical, maybe. So uh, it's about uh, like the, the the personalization you can have. So if there is like a templating system for which you can personalize the the front end part. And uh, actually, there is another question, but I will wait. Uh... Okay. Okay, so is there like a templating system uh, for the personalization and how hard it is to personalize the GDB for your own specific uh, uh, species? It's, it's very simple, 10 minutes. So you need a text, you, you need uh, pictures, you put them into some specific uh, directories, that the system is uh, is reading, and then the system will read and, and incorporate your template. Okay. And the other question is uh, is related to how uh, the back end to the front end communication works. So, um, like uh, there is like the PHP module, right? That it's uh, it's in charge of uh, the rendering of everything. So I was wondering if there is like a a sort of API that is calling or a remote procedure call or something like that, um, or the PHP directly connects to the database to retrieve the information? Um, for what I know, because Noah is the expert in, in, in this thing, so and he's not here, so he cannot give you more details. But uh, as I know, it's just PHP interacting with the database. We want to, to keep that simple. But um, in the same way that we keep simple, we don't know how difficult it's going to be in the future also to be able to integrate that with uh, this system to communicate between uh, different databases. But for now, yeah, it's PHP interacting with the possibly database that tell the system where are the files. I see. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, so there are no other questions. Uh, so Thomas, I guess we can move on to the next uh, speaker. Thanks a lot again, Aure. Yep, thank you. Great. So uh, I wanted to introduce the, the next speaker. 
Um, so this is Branka, Branka Lalik is a professor at the University of Novi Sad uh, in the Faculty of Agriculture in Serbia. Uh, we, we met uh, a few weeks or a month ago, more or less, in, in Madrid in a Cost Action Connect event where we uh, discussed about the needs for generating fair data. Uh, and we are actually very, uh, we share many, many ideas and we actually think that both the cost action that she's leading now in uh, micro uh, climate and our uh, cost action integrate and our Rapidia uh, initiative share many, many common things. Um, so about how to manage data, how to in uh, incorporate that data and, and how to make it fair. So um, Branka, uh, she has a lot of experience in dynamical modeling and, and biophysical processes, uh, the development of the biometeorological models. She did her bachelor in physics, but then her postgraduate and PhD students, she focused on, on modeling physical processes describing biosphere and atmosphere interactions and their implementation in uh, numerical weather prediction and agrometeorological models. Um, now she's chair of the Cost Action CA2018, uh, which is called a Fair Network of Micro. micro okay, so that was micro something. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tomas got stuck. So please, Branka, uh, go ahead uh, and uh, I will help you out with the question and answering. Waiting, I guess, to, to Tomas <laughs> to get unstuck. Sorry for that. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me, Marco? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. Okay, thank you, Marco, and thank you for having me today. Uh, well, as uh, Tom said, we are uh, cost action devoted to uh, micrometeorological measurements, actually, our main goal to, is to enhance uh, fairness of micrometeorological uh, data. Uh, we are actually currently uh, I mean, a consortium of, 20, of 29 uh, countries and about 120 researchers and 20 civilizations uh, all around the world with partners in Canada, United States, Australia, China, so, and we are expanding, of course, but uh, before uh, I start with this presentation. Let me just uh, briefly uh, introduce you with our, mo our motives uh, for this action. Uh, as you are very, very well aware, I mean, some of the greatest challenges of uh, this century, like sustainable living in, in cities, uh, in which now lives more than 50% of the world population, and sustainable uh, food production are either cause or consequence of uh, climate change. Climate, climate change is not uh, questionable, but uh, data uh, which is supposed to help us to better assess and better mitigate and adapt, adapt to effects of climate change are. Uh, I'm not sure how much you're familiar with uh, the topic, but the fact is that there is a lot of money invested in uh, different uh, sources of uh, climate data or meteorological data. I mean, uh, from uh, World Meteorological Organization uh, databases through European Center for Medium Weather Forecast database through, of course, Copernicus, uh, containing not only uh, in gathering not only uh, satellite data, but, but also different kinds of measurements, remote sensing. So. There is a lot, a lot of different uh, meteorological and climatological data uh, available, less or more. But the problem is that uh, if we deal with uh, energy consumption in the cities or food production and drought effect, we actually have to know uh, more about, not more, but everything. Uh, about uh, micrometeorological conditions. It means uh, meteorological conditions on a few hundred meters or up to one kilometer scale. So what's going on in a particular street or urban canyon? What about uh, heat islands in cities or uh, drought effects uh, in uh, plant canopies in rural areas? And this is the focus of this action, how to uh, 
let's say, motivate people to bring their the throttle, their measurements uh, on one place and share it at least on, on some level or to make these data fair because there is enormous amount of micrometeorological measurement during i mean since the beginning of 20th century early 20s and 20th century up to now during the 100 years uh, we have data from uh, experiments organized for a few years or 50 years in, in forest canopies urban areas but uh, a lot of, of this data uh, is stored on some storages where, Commonly on some somebody computer, somebody compute some on computer, or uh, it is somehow available, but it's not obvious how to use this available data. What are restrictions and uh, how and when uh, uh, and where actually these data are measured? So let me just briefly uh, remind you about fair principles because for us it's central. Uh, for example, when we are talking about findability of data, it means uh, the data should be uh, found by humans or machines. Uh, it's, I mean, it's easier to understand, but these humans and machines are supposed to uh, be able to access data under uh, specific conditions and restrictions. And this is one on the one of uh, most sensitive points. Uh, you know, open data and open science uh, is something what I very much advocate of. But uh, be honest, uh, fully open science is some golden standard. And I'm not sure where, when we will achieve this standard. Of course, we're supposed to work toward this goal. But for some people don't like to share data, simply as that. And uh, our goal is try to try to negotiate this through uh, application of fair principles. And this accessibility is one of the main points because uh, fair principles uh, assume that your metadata, it means data about your data, are available and open access and have uh, permanent open access. But uh, data per se, I mean, measured micrometeorological data should be open. Uh, accessibility uh, to data is defined by licensing and the uh, owner of data. So data can be completely open and I mean, fully open or fully closed or some, something in between is up to uh, data owner. This is very important, at least in this first stage. Uh, also, also, this uh, interoperability of data is a very important issue for us because uh, measurements uh, in meteorology are not questionable. I mean, World Meteorological Organization is a very uh, traditional organization and uh, uh, tools and the methods of meteorological measurements are very precisely defined. But uh, when it goes to format of uh, data used for storage or variables which will be in these files, uh, it's some other questions. So we are advocating to make some sort of uh, standards in uh, this uh, sphere. And of course, for us, reusability is very important because huge, huge part of community uh, are not climatologists, are not meteorologists, they are simply people using data. So each user is supposed to know how can use a particular data set. Uh, what are what is what are permission what are permissions uh, related to this data set? And actually, this is. Uh, one of most important goals of uh, our cost action. The, let's say, backbone of this uh, action is uh, our knowledge uh, shared platform. And uh, of course, one can come with question, why another repository uh, when there is, as I said, so many uh, different sources of uh, climate data, meteorological data, the answer is simple as that. Uh, yes, there is a lot of uh, sources of data, but not micrometeorological data, and absolutely not uh, very well, uh, data very well accompanied with uh, metadata. 
And uh, this actually, this knowledge share platform is very much about uh, metadata. So uh, we are now in, in uh, stage two of testing this platform, and we are positive that uh, we will launch it uh, in early January, just after the, the Christmas and New Year uh, break. Uh, during this last year, this first year of our action, we actually worked uh, on uh, building infrastructure. Regarding uh, KSP, uh, we, we were devoted to define the most important uh, network uh, metadata site and sensor metadata which uh, should be uh, involved in our KSP knowledge share platform because, you know, when uh, certain data pass through this knowledge share platform and finally end up on uh, some repository like uh, Zenodo or some, some else or something else. Uh, this is supposed to be this is supposed to be a fair. So we should uh, provide environment to which will somehow teach during the step-by-step -step process uh, our participants, our contributors, uh, how to make uh, their data and metadata fair. And you can just uh, have a short look on some main principles and main uh, data which we assume that are important uh, and should be part of this uh, metadata part of uh, knowledge uh, shared platform. Uh, of course, this, uh, we choose the Noto as our repository, base repository, but not necessary. Uh, because it's an uh, open access repository, uh, CERN is uh, charged for this, and we are just hoping that it will uh, work uh, properly. Uh, so this will be our main uh, storage space, but uh, we actually plan to, at the end or close to the end of action, transfer this to uh, European Open Science Cloud, of course. Uh, in respect to implementation of the action, uh, uh, during this uh, period, we actually work on two parallel uh, lines. One is, of course, development of uh, knowledge share platform and uh, this infra part of infrastructure. But the second one uh, is uh, related to uh, inventory of available in situ uh, microbiological data. So, uh, we were actually interested to know uh, on which data we can count on this particular moment. And uh, in first year, we established uh, one uh, network, let's say, of uh, available data in sense that uh, these networks and on, on these locations uh, are people uh, which would like to share their data with the uh, community. And uh, of course, we are expanding, uh, hoping that uh, we will have a little bit uh, more dense network in, in the future. So if anybody from the participants to this meeting are interested to share their microbiological data with us, uh, later on, I will leave to our contacts. So we will be really excited to, to have you in, in our team. Uh, next important uh, step is education, uh, because their principles are, you know, uh, for some people, a term which is familiar, but they are not very well aware how to make uh, certain data, certain micrometrological data in this case, fair. Uh, so we uh, actually work on uh, evaluating and enhancing enhancing uh, fairness of data of our uh, participants and try to teach them how to do this. Uh, we end up with one very simple uh, to-do list of, uh, let's say, 16 questions, four questions related to each of four uh, fair principles. And uh, we find out that it is the, maybe the most uh, simple, I mean, simplest and the uh, best first step toward, uh, toward the fairness of data. And we just use one example uh, of uh, testing. Uh, it's one uh, data set uh, for a few years measured in one orchard in Serbia and put this uh, data through our to-do list to, to our test uh, uh, questions to see how much these data are fair and what we actually supposed to do to improve uh, fairness of uh, these 
data. Uh, the next step in our building infrastructure is uh, define uh, pilot uh, data sets which will be used in uh, this platform. And you can see one example of this, uh, these data sets measured in the rural area. Uh, and you can guess that this uh, part related to uh, location characteristics of uh, location, orientation, things like that uh, are very, very important uh, metadata. But you know, uh, we have to have in mind that uh, one guy metadata or data for another person, you know, for uh, people from an ag agronomy uh, area, uh, our metadata related to canopy structure and orientation and type of uh, plants and technology dynamics are actually data and micrometrology are metadata. So uh, we are we are very very much count on this fact in our future work uh, with the, the, this KSP uh, platform and the metadata uh, database uh, establishment. Uh, and of course uh, for us is uh, very important how uh, this gathered knowledge, not only about uh, micrometrological data, but also uh, data uh, uh, measurement, orga measurement uh, organizations, uh, data simulation and management, uh, how uh, this can help uh, early career scientists and PhD students and scientists in general to improve uh, their skills. Uh, so our very important goal is to uh, reach to stakeholders and end users and uh, try to help them to uh, enhance their transferable skills. You know, transferable skills are uh, in really high demand uh, on labor labor uh, market, but uh, according to uh, many people from the industry, they are actually not uh, quite satisfied with. Uh, uh, transferable skills of, of people, young people coming from uh, academia. And uh, therefore, we uh, design one, uh, let's say, plan how to help, uh, first of all, young people uh, to enhance uh, their skill and knowledge uh, related to uh, micrometrological measurements and micrometrological data. Uh, and this plan uh, actually uh, includes assessment of current state, of course, uh, knowledge and skill program selection and design, implementation, and evaluation of uh, results. Uh, and we consider this as a very important uh, element of our knowledge uh, share platform and our action because, you know, data per se and knowledge per se is uh, not enough if it's not uh, put in, in practical use uh, for, for individuals and, uh, and groups. Uh, in current phase, we are on this assessment stage and uh, we developed uh, one, uh, let's say, questionnaire uh, for early career scientists and PhD students just to assess what kind uh, of uh, hard skill and uh, soft skill and transferable skill uh, they uh, consider as, as uh, the strong uh, side uh, for some sort, sort of uh, self-assessment. And uh, also we offer uh, them to improve their transferable skill uh, in the field of micrometrological measurements uh, to uh, uh, enhancement of knowledge related to micrometrological instrumentation uh, experimental design, uh, data simulation, critical control, and gap filling. All those five uh, topics are very important if you're supposed to deal with uh, micrometrological, I mean, metrological data in general, but uh, in this case, we are very much uh, interested in micrometrological data. So uh, I will also post uh, uh, on the chat a link to our web page and uh, it will be great if you can distribute these questionnaires among uh, your community and your earlier career scientists uh, because we really would like to know more about uh, young people feeling related to micrometrology, micrometrology in general and uh, gathering better knowledge about uh, this data and uh, their application. 
uh, of course, we will produce one guideline for future practice because, you know, if you are not from atmospheric science community and from some reason you're supposed to measure some meteorological data, some atmospheric data, uh, it can be right there. I mean, there is a guide uh, from WMO, but this is, you know, a few hundred pages of guidelines how to put automatic weather station on, on a certain position and how to measure and it's really nightmare if you are not familiar with this so we this, we will uh, end up with one uh, very simple guide uh, in sense uh, on what is supposed to be focused when purchasing automatic weather station how to put this station and make the to-do list for not professionals in, in this area, how to organize measurements and assimilate micrometeorological data, fill gaps, uh, and uh, without uh, ending uh, with uh, some data sets which are not uh, fair and which you cannot neither share or properly use for your purposes. Uh, also, we are very keen to establish our neighboring community. Uh, we like to, to call you like this because you are uh, our neighboring community. Uh, people, projects, actions, uh, citizen science uh, groups uh, interested in uh, microbiological data and their applications. So once more, I'm really, really uh, happy to be uh, on this kickoff meeting and uh, share uh, our ambitions with uh, you. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm hoping also that you will be part of our transferable activities because uh, as you're going toward the, the end of our action, we are always looking after different activities, different uh, projects, which will, uh, let's say, uh, be active after uh, end of our action on which uh, data and knowledge from our action will be in use. And uh, on this way, some sort of uh, prolonged uh, uh, life of uh, this action. And uh, thank you, thank you for your attention. And uh, of course, I'm open for all your questions and comments. Thanks a lot, Branka, for, uh, for your very nice talk. So uh, we are currently don't have any question on the on the question and answer. So for all the attendees, please feel free uh, to open the question and answer panel and write down uh, your question. Also, if they are related to previous speakers. And uh, uh, by the way, sorry, <laughs> my apologies for the, the minor technical. I should say micro. Actually, I think <laughs> technical problem yes. that we have. No and uh, so we are waiting for Thomas to be back even though we are a little bit scared in the meanwhile I have uh, actually a couple of questions and the first micro, one is micro, related micro, to... micro, 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 micro. <laughs> Thomas this is yeah. this is on me this is <laughs> this is on me I invoked him and uh, this is the result okay. uh, anyway I think we are trying to to fix uh, this problem and uh, hopefully anyway um, yeah, I have a couple of questions, and the first one is related to the European infrastructure that you are, um, let's say, uh, exploiting or using, let's say, because I saw the link on Zenodo, so I was wondering if there are other um, open-air uh, European resources uh, that are using, like, the, the cloud and all these, uh, and, and this is kind of related to the second question I have uh, that is linked to the sensory data that you were talking about, since um, there must be really a huge amount of data uh, which might be uh, the problem in uh, in using storing and uh, and analyzing this data uh, yes yes absolutely thank you for your question uh, well we we choose the nodo i mean for obvious reasons because CERN is uh, CERN is a huge institution and we simply believe in in uh, stability of this repository uh, and this is actually during this uh, working state of uh, our KSP. Uh, at the end, we are planning to transfer this to, to European Open Science Cloud. But to be honest, uh, we are not completely aware about all uh, features and technical characteristics of this Open Science Cloud. I was 
writing to some contact persons, uh, not gathering answer till now. So we are actually working on this uh, uh, trial version. Uh, so uh, we will put our data and metadata on Zenodo and uh, hopefully make some sort of migration to Open Science Cloud at the end of the project. Of course, uh, there will be enormous amount of uh, data, uh, but as I said, this is powerful uh, repository, and I think that we, have, we will not uh, have any kind of problem with uh, managing this data, because actually we will manage all the metadata. Uh, real data, real measurements, real meteorological data will be stored uh, by owners on Zenodo. So Zenodo will take care about actual measurements and we will take care about uh, management of metadata. That, that, that is the plan. Thanks a lot. We actually have a question now uh, from Tomas. That... Mar Marco, about... I think now you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, finally, finally, the bug finally. went away. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, I, I guess you can ask the question yourself. Yes, yes. Thanks, Marco. Uh, sorry, Branka, for not being able to introduce you to the very mo last moment. But I think I, 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 I was almost finishing <laughs> when yeah. the bug occurred in the micro. Yeah. Um, I, I was just um, curious about whether you had uh, different sources of experiences with the. Uh, uh, people working, you know, in, in phenotyping data for agricultural systems. What, what, how has been the integration of your community with their community? Yeah, thank you, Tom, for this question, because, you know, I'm, I'm living with biologists, I'm working with biologists, so <laughs> I am completely surrounded with people from, from biology, uh, molecular biology and Yes, I, I'm absolutely familiar with the uh, problems uh, of people from biological, uh, different fields of, of biology. Uh, regarding phenology, uh, we are really lucky that uh, in Serbia, for example, we have this uh, plant protection and forecasting uh, service, uh, servicing plant uh, forecasting and protection, which is responsible for whole country region. Uh, this is service specialized in monitoring micrometeorological uh, conditions, uh, harmful organisms, and phenology, plant phenology dynamics in a different uh, source of agricultural production. And they, uh, with our help at the beginning, uh, established a very, uh, very good, uh, good database of phenological observations, which is uh, actually not only descriptive, but a numerical one. So we have numbers for metrology and we have numbers for phenology, uh, phenological stages of plant, and uh, let's say some uh, description of uh, dynamics or, and uh, abundance of uh, an emergence of uh, harmful organisms, uh, pests and diseases. So uh, we are actually using these uh, norms and these uh, data regarding uh, plant and uh, insect uh, phenology. So actually we have no problem with, with this, but uh, everything is numerical format. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Hopefully in the near future, you will be interacting with us uh, as a new source of integrating micro uh, micrometeorological data with uh, with phenology and, and, and phenotyping data, uh, there, there are already some uh, few places uh, working in 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 uh, predicting and generating models um, for behavior of, of of grapevines based on future um, um, climate uh, scenarios, right? So I, I think that is definitely challenging and something that we eventually want to be able to, to include in our, in our uh, great PDF portal. Thank you very much, Branka. Thank you for having me. Okay, so we have finished this uh, second uh, section of our kickoff meeting. Thanks to everyone uh, attending. We, we actually, we have been very um, happy. We are very happy with all the attendance. And morning we had over 100 attendees. Now we have around 90 uh, plus the panelists. We are quite, quite happy. Um, so 
Uh, we do have coffee break now, and we come back at 4 p.m. with uh, the section entitled Grapevine Resources as Models of uh, Grapepedia. Thanks uh, for your assistance.
and then come back to you. Okay, awesome. Try not to get stuck this time. <laughs> yeah, if I get stuck, please let me know somehow and meet <laughs> me. It was really fun, actually. Yeah. <laughs> For us, at least. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Anyway, um, okay. we have a lot of attendees. I'm quite happy of that. So uh, I don't know how many of them are uh, joining for the first time. So I will briefly mention some few things regarding the morning session and the whole participation and then start the, the presentations. Okay, but, but now just as of the, just the panelists can hear? No, no, no. Now everybody can hear actually. Mm -hmm. Okay then, so good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome again uh, to the third section of our kickoff meeting, of our Grapidia kickoff meeting. This time uh, we give the, uh, the spot and the light uh, highlights to great buying resources. So during the rest of the kickoff meeting, we will talk about what it's already available of the things that we are gathering for great buying. Uh, in terms of data and resources, and to discuss the ways on uh, which we will integrate these in, in our portal. Uh, I would like to uh, thank again to uh, all the attendees. We have a high participation from everywhere in, in the planet, more than 200 registrations. Right now we are um, 70 attendees, plus the 12 panelists. Um, let me remind you that we are recording the whole day of meetings, so everything will be available in our social media and YouTube, in Bilibili, and um, also in our website. And um, the, the morning session was basically introducing the Wikipedia project, then the following section was uh, the experience of uh, some of uh, the people working in the SIG team. Uh, but also outside of the of the Grapida SIG team uh, in other species and databases of these other species. And now is the turn of, of great buying resources. So I leave the stage to Marco Moreto from FEM. He will talk about the Vespucci uh, platform and how it will be integrated in Grapidia. So thanks a lot, a lot Tom, for, uh, for the introduction. And uh, <clears throat> yeah. 
So I'm Marco Moretto. I work for Fondazione Adumo Mac in Italy, in San Michele Alladige. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the, the updates uh, that uh, we are doing for Vespucci, that is our gene expression platform for grapevine. Okay, first of all, I will give us a very small and brief overview about what Vespucci is. And Vespucci actually uh, stands for Vitis Expression Studies Platform Using Command Compendia Instances. It's an long acronym, and actually, spoiler alert, it won't be the only one. So there will be a lot of acronyms. Anyway, in a nutshell, Vespucci is a, a, a gene expression matrix. It's a gigantic gene expression matrix in which we collected all the data that are available uh, publicly. Okay, so all the data that are published upon publication and that are freely available to download from platforms like, like uh, NCBI, GEO, or RA Express. And what we did was to collect everything to normalize everything, uh, also from the numerical point of view, but also on the metadata point of view. So since it is a matrix, essentially the two dimensions that you can consider are the rows, okay? And each of the row in our uh, gene expression matrix is of course one gene that is measured across uh, different conditions. And together with uh, uh, the information about what gene it is, there are also the information about what it does. So the functional annotation, we have of course, uh, information about the gene ontology, if it is an enzyme, uh, and all the possible information you may think of. And related to the other dimension, these are the columns, of course, of our uh, matrix, uh, and these represent conditions, okay? So conditions might be one single sample or more samples. I won't go too much into details in why uh, this is the case, but it's related to the way in which we normalize data. But the important thing to keep in mind is that uh, conditions uh, are uh, annotated. So the terms are uh, labeled, let's say, uh, in order to have a, a structured way, a more easy way to look for specific condition throughout uh, the whole matrix. And this information, of course, are related to uh, the genotype, uh, the tissue that is, uh, uh, that, that is the actual sample, if there are stresses like biotic stress, uh, or if it is, uh, uh, like a developmental stage uh, uh, related sample and so on and so forth. So considering uh, the, the, timeline, the timeline in which uh, Vespucci was developed, the original idea started in 2014 and uh, that was the first uh, time in which we actually created a database using uh, a technology that actually was taken from bacteria. So uh, something similar was done for bacteria and uh, we essentially adapted it uh, in order to work also for higher eukaryotes. But, uh, okay, we had uh, we encountered different problems because essentially we had uh, to patch and adapt a lot of the code. In any case, we ended up with the first release of our database in 2016. But after that, we decided that it would have been way, way better to overhaul the old technology. So we started from scratch developing everything in Python and uh, uh, both for the back end and the front end of the application. And the process uh, of uh, developing everything has been pretty long, actually, uh, also because during this time we lost, um, uh, we, we lost our leader in the sense. So the, um, uh, the leader uh, researcher that started uh, uh, the old project uh, and he left the academia. So we were essentially uh, one less. Uh, but in any case, uh, we managed to uh, end up uh, uh, publishing the second release of Vespucci uh, early this year. And for the future, we are actually thinking about uh, going on uh, in the sense that we are going to update, of course, with all the new experiments that are uh, already available uh, from this year and will be available next year, together with uh, new data and new way to exploit it, so new tools uh, and new ways of exploring the old database. So speaking a little bit uh, more in details about the updates, of course, there will be uh, a data update. Up to now, we have uh, already all the experiments, uh, mostly actually all RNA-seq experiment up until 2021. And this is thanks to the work done by Camilla Rastenholz and uh, Amadine Welt from Irai Kolmar. And uh, we also are working towards, since we have a very, a lot of few thousand, like I think there are more or less 8,000 
different samples coming from different conditions, of course, uh, we started to perform an analysis related to SNP detection using RNA-seq. And this, uh, uh, this is done by Diego Micheletti, that is also my, a colleague of mine working in Fundazione Edwin Mack. And together with that, we are going also to expand um, the, the programmatic interfaces that we are providing uh, that are, of course, based on uh, the R programming language and the Python programming languages uh, with Paolo Sonego, that is the lead design of the R package. And lastly, uh, we are going to uh, hopefully uh, early next year, um, let's say to publish, probably uh, at least uh, in GitHub, um, another program that we use for the semantic annotation of samples that we call season and yes this is a, another an acronym and speaking about the uh, season as a, as a program it's one of the two programs that we use to actually build uh, our compendium as i said the compendium it's based on um the numerical information so the metrics itself and the metadata information that are related both of genes and also uh, related to the samples annotation and season it's um it's a text annotation program that helps out uh, uh, the annotation. Uh, so it helps out to structure the information that are related to samples. So um, every time that there is a free text, that this is most of the case, right? So uh, every time that we have a description of the sample, this is just free text. So it's not structured and it's really hard to query and to collect and, and to categorize. So one way to do that, to deal with that, is to use ontology terms uh, in order to annotate this text. And essentially, Season is doing exactly that. So it helps out uh, uh, trying to recognize automatically which are the, ontolog the ontological terms uh, that are linked uh, to the actual uh, text. So for, in this example, for example, sorry for the repetition, uh, Vitis vinifera is uh, an NCBI taxon ontology term. OK, so the tool uh, correctly recognizes that. And the berries, uh, that is actually berries, so it also recognizes plural and singular. It's a plant ontology term, but we they don't have necessarily to be real ontology. So we can also use the VFC that is a, a more, let's say, uh, a controlled vocabulary for cultivar names. Together with season, the other program that we use, of course, to build uh, the numerical matrix, uh, it's named command that stands for com <laughs> Compendium Management Desktop, and is the backend program. It's a web application that we developed, and uh, it's the one that is used to actually uh, to actually collect all the raw data and to perform the normalization, and in the end give out uh, the numerical matrix. And uh, throughout command, it's possible to perform different kind of normalizations, and also uh, that depends on the different kind of design that we might have, like in this. Uh, um, in this screenshot, we see that uh, uh, more samples can be grouped together and uh, a log ratio, so um, a contrast can be calculated between, between two different conditions, uh, since this is one of the ways in which we provide the normalization through Vespucci. Another way in which we provide normalization is simply uh, the transcript per million, so the TPN normalization. Together, these two programs allow uh, to build uh, our database. And uh, we then provided uh, another layer on top of everything that is called COMPASS. Yes, it's another acronym that stands for Compendium Programmatics Assist uh, Support Software. That is our programmatic interface. It's a GraphQL interface, and Graph stands for Graph, not for Graphical. So it's, uh, it's a programmatic interface. It's a query language, actually that allows you to query every part of the data model that we designed for Vespucci and to use those data for any kind of, of analysis. On top of this uh, Compass uh, GraphQL uh, interface, we developed a couple of packages, one R package and one Python package that is up the process of querying and filtering and performing analysis uh, using uh, Vespucci data. So, how does it work uh, with Vespucci inside the, the Grapidia project? Well, first of all, let me give a brief overview of uh, uh, the Grapidia um, infrastructure. Okay, this is just a brief overview. Walter San 
Verino is going to go a little bit more in details uh, with his explanation uh, in his talk uh, at, uh, at five, I think. Uh, so for the moment, let's say that uh, uh, Grapidia, of course, starts uh, from the community and then tries to go back to the community itself. And that being said, uh, there, there are, uh, the idea is to collect uh, as many resources that are out there related to grapevine. And this depends on uh, the different uh, researcher or research group uh, or people that, that might want to be involved so that want to share uh, their data across the community itself. Um, as Tomas was saying in the beginning, the approach of Grepedia, it's a, a, a hybrid federated system. This is something that I, I also see on the, on the talk uh, of Mikhail uh, about uh, the WIT IS. Uh, in which they are also using an ETL tool, so uh, a tool that uh, uh, helps out uh, in gathering information and uh, collect everything into a single data model. This is uh, essentially the same thing that uh, we, we are going to do. Um, but this is one part of the story, since uh, there are other resources that already provide uh, an application program interface uh, that don't necessarily need to be integrated into the database, that, but can be called directly from uh, um, uh, from the API. So once uh, all the um, resources are collected, uh, the other part is to provide one coherent interface, so a REST API or any kind of a programmatic API, so one single point of access with a one unique model for uh, looking for the data, for querying the data, and for retrieving the data. And this is very important, of course, because the API has to be maintainable, has to be to take in consideration that uh, different resources might, might come up uh, with time. There might be different uh, versions for the same resources and stuff like that. And uh, it has to be coherent. Again, it has to be maintainable and it has to be easy to use. And the last part are all the resources, all the services, sorry, that will go back, let's say, to the community. And uh, for services, of course, there will be a web portal like uh, we all want in the sense that uh, um, it's like the first way in which you can really understand which are the resources that are available with a description, the possibility to, to go from one to the other, uh, but also um, a part uh, dedicated to dashboards. So different ways in which you can perform analysis and and redo simple analysis with plots uh, and charts uh, calculated on the fly that might be for simple analysis or even more complex uh, in which different kinds of resources might be integrated. And the last part is workflows. Okay, Workflows uh, should be something that uh, has to be easy to use for, uh, for users, uh, but also should allow the possibility to use uh, our own data, so local data, together with data provided uh, by Grapedia. So in all of these, Vespucci stands as uh, just another resource. So uh, Vespucci will be one of the resources uh, that will be uh, available for uh, gene expression data. And since Vespucci uh, was designed essentially to have an API and essentially to be queried uh, directly from uh, uh, a GraphQL API, uh, we don't essentially need to store anything of this data uh, locally in Grapidia, we can directly call Pucci API. Okay, so in this sense, service Pucci will be really like a federated database because it's living somewhere. And from Grapidia, you don't really know where it is, but you don't care. The important thing is that the way in which you access the Vespucci resource will be coherent with everything else. Okay. Just to conclude, there is a, the reference if you want to uh, have a little bit more uh, information about how to use it. There is a lot of documentation online. Uh, you can refer to our publication that was published in Frontiers early this year. And to very conclude, uh, let me acknowledge all the people, the amazing people that I have uh, the honor to work with, starting from Paolo in, uh, in Fondazione Edumac, and Diego, Stefania, Julia, Laura, of course, that helped me out a lot with the uh, uh, the SNP uh, pipeline, as well with uh, uh, the annotation of samples. Uh, 
Tommaso, of course, Camille and uh, Amandine, and uh, from here, Walter and Marco Di Marsico that I'm working with, uh, and of course, Jerome and uh, Anne-Marie for the part of the CIG. And thank you all. If you have any question, please uh, uh, write it down in a question and, uh, and answering. And uh, otherwise, if there is someone from the panelists that want to ask something using the voice, uh, I will be glad to answer. Thank you all. Thank you, Marco, for your very nice presentation. Uh, we have actually uh, a question in the Q&A section. So Paula is uh, asking, do you carry out disease resistant works using SNP analysis in GRAPE? Uh, well, this is some, one of the things that uh, will be possible to do once we have that information, that's for sure. This is, let's say, one of the uh, end applications that uh, will be performed once we have that, those data. Uh, more or less in the same sense, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, Marco, uh, so right now, uh, all the available public data has been mapped to the reference genome, right? But yes. as we know that each time we get more data, transcriptomic data from different cultivars and most uh, of some of these cultivars are already being sequenced and their genomes are, are available. Will Vespucci have a model uh, of specific expression for cultivars, like cultivar specific expressions? <laughs> this is a... Um, this is a very nice question, actually, because the best way... There are pros and cons, let's say. So... Of course, having one reference genome uh, simplifies uh, a lot of my work. Actually, a lot of uh, uh, Amandine works uh, in performing the alignment because she just has to align on one single reference. And also when you do the comparison, of course, it's easier because uh, the genes, it's the same. The problem is that you might lose information, especially when you are aligning something that is not a Pinot Noir. Even though PN, if I remember correctly, is not even a, a real Pinot Noir, right? Maybe Camille can add something about that later. Anyway, so there are, of course, the problems. So the best way will be, of course, to align uh, RNA seq, uh, let's say, coming from Cabernet Sauvignon to the Cabernet Sauvignon genome. But at the point, you will have the other problem. So how can I make a comparison between Cabernet Sauvignon transcriptomic and uh, Pinot Noir transcriptomic, let's say? Uh, so you will need a way in which you can map uh, all of the genes so to have uh, a correct information about homology between the different uh, uh, cultivars. So in the end, you're going to lose something anyway. And uh, the problem, the, the computational problem, let's say it's, um, I mean, it's big because it, it's about, you know, to realign everything to specific genome, but it's not unbearable. It's something that is absolutely doable. But the most problematic thing will be exactly to have, uh, uh, let's say, one mapping, one correct mapping between genes coming from a different cultivar. And this is not uh, as easy as it, as it might sound, since uh, it's not just a matter of performing a blast, a reciprocal best blast it, and that's it. I mean, you have to be sure that the, the gene actually exists, is functional, and uh, is doing more or less the same thing. Great, thanks, Marco. Um, we don't have any other questions in the Q&A section or by the panelists, but if you uh, think of any uh, further questions you want to do later on to Marco, please uh, drop us a line and, and uh, send the questions through the Q&A uh, section. Thanks, Marco, very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, so now it's... Uh, my turn. Uh... So let me introduce Thomas. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, Tom, shall I really? <laughs> no, I'm joking. But yeah, please, Thomas. I mean, I think every one of you already know Thomas. So I won't spend uh, <laughs> too much time. <laughs> but Thomas is going to talk about um, uh, the future of uh, all the tools that he developed uh, in his lab. So, all the Vitis Vits. Uh, uh amazing tool that that his group actually i know that most of the stuff has been uh, actually developed by uh, your amazing students and uh, how that uh, um, uh, set of different tools uh, will uh, let's say be integrated within uh, the Gropedia project so please Tomasa, the stage is yours thank you marco so uh, Mar marco has been talking in the past minutes on on how 
his resource would uh, be ideally integrated in, in uh, uh, the Graypedia platform or portal. And the same goes with any other type of database or resources that the community generates. So in, in that sense, what we have been collecting and, and generating in, in our research group is a, a series of tools, visualization tools. So we gather all of them in what we call the, the BTS visualization platform of the BitBiz. And we offer these apps to the, to the community on, on this uh, website, bitbiz.tomsbialab.com. And eventually we would like to, to have them integrated uh, in Gradepedia so can be accessed directly through that portal. So um, first of all, as Mark also comment, uh, I would like to acknowledge the guys who have been actually working in the creation of the BitBiz platform, which are the bioinformatic team of my, of my lab. Uh, actually here they are in their bioinformatic cave how I like to, to call it, uh, where they do their brainstorming and all the coding for, for our platform on many of the studies that, that we do. So these are David, who is a postdoc at the lab, and Antonio and Luis, which are PhD students. Um, so our main goal in the lab is functional characterization. So um, we, if, you, if you see these two plots, the first one talking about gene characterization throughout the last uh, 20 years, and then the amount of works on the left, on the right side of transcriptomic or other omics uh, experiments that have been published throughout the, uh, the years, we see an exponential growth in genes that are being characterized, gene families that are being described, and omic technologies that are being used to um, to characterize uh, the basically the genes of the grapevine. Uh, so. Um, unfortunately, despite all of this amount of data that is being generated and information that is available, uh, there are no actual databases, at least for the functional uh, information that uh, we are gathering as a community in the past 20 years. Um, this uh, was the first uh, um, thing that allowed us to maybe create some kind of um, functional repository or catalog, what we call the catalog, to start um, saving or uh, storaging or storing all the um, information regarding gene being, genes being characterized in grapevine uh, and uh, gene families being uh, described also in these species. In the case of omics data that has been also increasing exponentially in, in, in the last years, uh, we thought of creating, but at the same time we, we were creating the, the catalog, uh, a group of tools that could help us to uh, identify genes that we could later, later on characterize. So our main focus was gene characterization and we, we developed these tools initially to assist us in our research, but we realized that they were quite uh, useful for the whole community. So uh, one of these first um, resources that we generated was the, the Great Gene Reference Catalog. So this is basically a compendium of information regarding functional data, phylogenies, and um, any type of data, whether it's expression data um, or uh, the identification of orthologs in, in different genome assemblies and accessions. Right now, the gene catalog has around 2,000 genes. These are genes that have been manually curated by our team and some uh, also by the community. And right now they belong to 56 uh, pathways and we have included 160 gene families. So we will go uh, later on, on on a demo on how to access the, the gene reference catalog, but basically we have different types of, of data. Uh, one of the most important data is the level of validation of the functional role for this gene. So this is a um, product or, or the result of a, a manual laboring in which we had to read all the articles in which genes were described and characterized. And according to the type of experiments done for each gene, a sort a of level of validation. Uh, and this is quite important when we are uh, later on using GFF files to do transcriptomic analysis, because then we can include this information, at least the gene IDs or the gene names, 
that have been given by the community and put them in a resource that it's unique and that can be used by in the same way by the whole community. Um, so the Great Difference Catalog has two different uh, interfaces. One is um, the, let's say, maintained by the curators, uh, which basically will look every, every on a period of time, literature and identify genes, validate them with the different levels of validation, and identify the correspondences of these genes in the different genome assemblies. Uh, right now, we have the catalog. Um, centered in the because um, annotation, but we are already moving to the before. And so far, we have also associated these IDs to the Carbonet Sauvignon genome. These uh, gene, uh, gene information have been uh, constantly updated. So we are now in, in a version two of the, of the catalog. And we can also have in the catalog the information regarding the expression of these genes. So for, for that, we have been um, uh, downloading public data, transcriptomic data, and we have included the uh, overall expression profiles uh, found in these public databases uh, and um, put this expression in the form of plots in within the, uh, the app that exports the information from the catalog and shows it in a, in a graphical interface. This is what we call the Gene Cards app, which has information coming from the catalog, information coming from these expression uh, analyses, and also um, these gene cards that not only include the genes from the catalog, but also genes that have not been uh, yet characterized or validated. So you have um, a gene card for each one of the uh, 30 thousand or more genes of the grapevine genome. All of these uh, information can be downloaded by the, by the researcher interface and the researcher at, at the same time can upload and submit new genes. So uh, this is what we actually expect from the community, that the community is able to uh, load uh, information regarding the genes that they are car currently characterizing once they have published it or prior to, to publication to send the data through the submission form and we will uh, manually add that information in the catalog. Uh, these are different levels of validation that I was talking to you before. So we have uh, levels from that go from hypothetical to validated and, and, and depend on the type of experiment or experimental approaches that have been used to characterize the genes, right? So we have genes that have been identified only based on similarity uh, using different um, uh, search tools or genes that have been identified through QTL, correlation experiments, co-expression networks, or genes that have been actually validated by either overexpression, knockout mutants uh, in heterologous species or uh, homologous species. Um, this uh, catalog, uh, is um, reachable through the Greypedia uh, website and the Integrate website. So here you can see that in the gene section, there's also, uh, there's already a submit um, part where you can uh, download the form and um, uh, add information regarding your genes. Actually, this form is what you see below here. It's a dynamic table where you can uh, add information regarding the, the gene information of the function, uh, any type of information that you have uh, um, gathered while it's being characterized, your contact details, um, subgroup pathways, and, 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 and so on. The idea is that this form will be uh, reachable by any ID. So you know that there are many different annotation versions for the reference genome. And you can um, add uh, the ID, uh, the preferred ID by, by you, and you can simply put that annotation version ID, and we will do the correspondency to all the other uh, versions. Now, um, very closely related to the Gene Cards app, we have also the Conversions app. So this is related to the um, to the different annotations and assemblies that the PN424 
has um, suffered through through uh, the last uh, 20 years. And you can see that the, the ways on which, on how we call the genes or the IDs that the genes get through the different assemblies have changed. And many of you maybe have suffered of these changes. Uh, we hope that with the conversions app, you are able to give uh, the app a list of genes on any ID and you will receive the correspondency on all the other IDs. Right now we are in, you know, as you may know, the, in the fourth assembly and the fourth annotation of the PN424 genome. And we have uh, ID correspondences uh, to all the previous IDs to the before. So uh, we hope that um, not only the, the catalog, but also the resources that we will use in the future are also based in this new annotation, whether they are transcriptomic data related and, and so on. Uh, finally, I, uh, I also wanted to, to briefly comment on these three apps that are related to gene expression. So um, we have been using public data, uh, similarly as they have been used for the Vespucci uh, platform, to create a series of applications in which we can explore how genes are expressed uh, throughout the public data. We have uh, different uh, atlases, a specific group of experiments regarding a specific type of organ or treatment. And we, you can explore the expression of a list of genes of interest within this specific group of, of uh, samples. Um, you can download uh, plots, heat maps, and use them directly in, in publications uh, as they are open access. We have also created an app for the generation of gene co-expression networks. I'll, I'll explain now how these are generated. Uh, and these are also downloadable. And even you can download the Cytoscape file and, and work with it. Uh, and also you can explore expression patterns throughout the whole um, data available in, in SRA. So what we have been uh, working on in the last three years is to uh, download and filter the public data. So we, we downloaded, we have downloaded so far almost 5,000 runs. Uh, these have been filtered and divided um, depending on the different apps that mm, we use. Uh, for instance, in the aggregated gene co-expression networks app, we have divided them uh, in uh, samples that are um, from leaf, from reproductive organs, so fruit or flower, from only berry, or from any kind of sample. So this is what we call the condition independent samples. Um, and we have created networks from each one of these subgroups of, of runs. In the case of the Exara, we have gathered 3,400 runs. And in the case of the gene card, which is uh, showing the expression also in different organs for the different genes of the catalog and genes uh, in the genome, uh, we have gathered uh, runs uh, around almost 3,000 runs for that. Um, in the case of the uh, aggregated GCNs, we have, in the case of the condition independent, almost 3,000 runs. So we have used these groups to, um, to create a whole genome uh, co-expression network. So there are many different ways of creating co-expression networks. Um, Co-expression, uh, it's a proxy for common uh, roles or common functions between genes, and especially in the case of re uh, regulatory proteins, such as transcription factors. Uh, Co-expression networks of these uh, genes coding for transcription factors can give um, very nice hypotheses based on the guilty by association principle on potential targets for these regulators. So we have created gene co-expression networks and we have evaluated them and used them in, in many different gene characterizations, especially regarding transcription factor gene characterizations. Um, these gene networks are um, scale-free topology. So we have uh, nodes that correspond to genes and edges that correspond to co-expression that can um, have uh, different levels of degrees within the network. That means that they are 
nodes with more connections than others. And in this way, we can try to identify what we call hubs that help us um, identify key regulatory uh, genes or proteins that could be related to uh, a phenotype or to a molecular process. How have we created this co-expression network? So basically we have compared aggregated versus non-aggregated. In the non-aggregated uh, mm, co-expression networks, what we do is to gather all the runs um, and we merge them in a count matrix and we compute uh, co-expression values from that matrix and we come up with a high reciprocal rank matrix from all of them together. In the case of aggregated uh, whole genome co-expression networks, from each experiment that has at least four runs, we calculate a soup matrix, uh, let's say a soup uh, network, and then we, for each uh, pair of genes, we count the number of soup networks in which they are appearing as correlated. So we end up with a different type of matrix, which is basically um, co-occurrence matrix. We have uh, performed these two type of co-expression networks for condition independent samples, for very, for reproductive, or also for, for leaf networks. And we have compared their performances. So very briefly, we have seen that the aggregated perform much better than the non-aggregated ones. Um, and uh, whether we use different genotologies, the performance is a bit better, so we get to, um, uh, we are able to predict a bit better the, the potential function of genes based on their co-expression networks. So uh, regarding the BitBiz app, what we have created is basically two um, ways in which you can enter this uh, AGG GCN app. The first one is simply an individual GCN. So you put the name of the gene and you uh, obtain the list of um, 400 um, top co-expressed genes for that gene that uh, it's of interest that you put here in the query. Uh, the other way of uh, obtaining data from this app is by putting a list of genes of interest. And in that sense, you will look for an interaction network. And here you can find all the relationships between these genes by looking the complete whole genome co-expression network. Uh, we have been using this app and the data generated by these uh, gene co-expression networks, uh, and we have already validated them through different uh, articles. Uh, so we have demonstrated they are a powerful prediction tool, uh, especially for uh, regulators of uh, plant secondary metabolism, but also for development. Um, and mm, of course, this is a, as a proxy of uh, of, of um, potential common roles in the case of co-expressed genes. So this needs to be used together with other um, experiments or other approaches that will be uh, overlap and will give us information on really what a fraction of a, a co-expressed uh, group of genes are really involved in the same pathway or are targets of a regulator and, and so on. One of the following apps that we have developed in the BTS visualization platform has to do with a, with a revolutionary technique that we have been uh, performing in our lab for the last three years, which is the DAPSEC. So DAPSEC is an in vitro version of, of the CHIPSEC, which is used to address all the potential uh, binding sites of a transcription factor in the, in the genome. Uh, and binding is also a proxy for regulation. Uh, we can identify the binding sites of a, of a protein in the genome and uh, overlap that data with other sources of data to try to find and delimit uh, target and regulatory networks for these transcription factors. So the DAPSEC basically is uh, putting in contact a transcription factor, which is fused to a tag uh, together with um, genomic DNA libraries that are in the case of uh, when a binding occurs, you can carry over and elude that those fragments that are bound to the transcription factor and then um, sequence them uh, to obtain regions in the genome where you have an enrichment of, of, of binding sites. 
Basically, in the case of the DAPSEC, what you use is a genome assembly and annotation file. So very similar to what you do on a RNC uh, bioinformatic procedure. You start with a FASTQ file, you train that, you align that, and then you use it with the GenePeak um, software together uh, with the transcription factor library and the input or the negative control library. Uh, by using these two um, sum files, you obtain a bed file with all the places in the genome where you have a binding uh, event. These binding events are um, depending on whether the accumulation or the enrichment of reads in a particular region follow a bell shape. If there is a motif uh, present in the center of these binding event, and if there is an enrichment of the um, transcription factor library versus the input, uh, and following these three uh, requirements, you get a file in which you can then uh, use the annotation file to assign the peaks to the genes. So what we have created is basically a genome browser where we have uploaded different tracks for different transcription factors. And in each one of these tracks, you can see how um, for a particular transcription factor, you get binding on the different uh, potential targets, right? In this case, MIT-15 binding to the promoter region of stilvenoid synthesis. You clearly see here uh, three binding events and actually these are uh, identified as three individual binding uh, events uh, in the uh, uh, computational analysis. Now I'm, I'm gonna end up with simply a visualized uh, version or by visualizing how, how you can explore the uh, bit, uh, BitBiz platform. So you simply write down the, the address, um, the bitbiz.tomsvlab.com address. And here you will find all the different apps that we uh, have available in the case of the gene card with information on the gene catalog. You can access the, the catalog table and download it or uh, search for the different genes that we have included in the catalog, the so far 2000 genes with all the different information. You can search by ID, you can search by gene. Um, here you can find information regarding functional validation, who has validated the references, um, the identification of correspondences in other genomes and so on. In the case of the gene cards, you can also do a search by ID or by gene name you will have here the information again regarding the different annotations, the functional validation, and as I mentioned before, the data regarding the expression. So these are SRA, SRA experiments that have been downloaded and you can check the expression and see uh, the particular runs on which these genes are highly expressed or lowly expressed. Then we have the case of the expression atlases. So here we have different types of atlases in the case, for instance, of the very development. These are data that has been published by Mariana Fasoli in 2018. So basically here we can, in, um, we can um, give an input, an Excel file uh, to, the, to the app in which it will compute immediately the, the expression and you can visualize this expression uh, in different ways, logarithmic scale, set a score, and you can explore a list of genes of interest and how they exp are expressed in the different conditions. And you can um, navigate through the different cultivars, uh, years, conditions that we offer through this uh, app. You can also download the plot and, and, and use this directly on, on, on your uh, expression uh, or in your... Um, presentations or in your articles. In the case of uh, the GCNs, you can also here um, basically have these two options in which you can indiv individual GCN on the interaction network. In the individual GCN, you put the name of, of a gene. Uh, for instance, the case of the UFGT, you simply put the, the, the name of the gene and you get the list of genes that are co-expressed with the UFGT. So you can see here many genes that are related, for instance, to the antocyanin pathway, as you would expect, are co-expressed with the UFGT1 gene. Um, you can, of course, download this data and you will have the uh, co-expression list for, for each one of the genes of the, of the genome. Finally, the interaction network is a dynamic um, uh, way to visualize how genes from a list 
uh, of uh, genes of interest are interacting in terms of co-expression. So you also give this um, input and you can visualize how the genes are co-expressed. You can navigate through the co-expression relationships. You can see which are the genes in a, in a module in a, uh, or genes that could be acting as potential hubs. And you can map different types of data in these, uh, in these networks, such as classification, uh, type of uh, um, uh, the enzyme that is being coded by the gene, and, and so on. Um, you can even move around the, the nodes to make it uh, um, better in the visualization, or you can download it uh, also. Then finally, you have the XR app, which is basically the exploration of the, the expression throughout the whole um, data you find in, in public repositories such as SRA. And again, with an input of genes of interest, you can explore expression through um, these, uh, these uh, experiments and you can go exactly uh, and see in which run you have a high expression and, and so on. And I think that, that with that, I will finish my, my presentation. Uh, there are other apps that are left for description. However, I hope that you got more or less an overview of the different uh, ways in which we can um, visualize expression data, genomic data, and functional data. And we hope that this can be eventually um, used in the Greatpedia platform for the use of the entire community. So thanks uh, for your uh, for your time. So thanks a lot, uh, Tomas, for the for the talk. And uh, so far, there are no questions yet uh, on the question and answer. I'll remember you just if you have any question, just open up the question and answer and write down your question and. Um, uh, also related maybe to previous uh, uh, speaker and, and talk, uh, and we will answer as soon as possible. And uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I will ask something related to data curation, since uh, this is a problem that uh, for sure we are sharing in the sense that, uh, Tomas, you, you talked about uh, the problem of data curation and uh, also for gene expression data, we have the same problem. So how do you see this, uh, you know, uh, in the in the project of Wikipedia, so how can be let's say solved because something essentially was uh, um, let's say proposed also uh, through the um, the hackathon of the gene annotation that was done at least a couple of times within uh, the integrate cost action. Uh, so how we can uh, and what is your idea and vision about that? Yeah, I I think that this is a very important subject that we need to address even before starting implementing the database. So everything that we will include in the database needs to be validated and manually curated. Uh, in the case of gene function, uh, it, it's, it, it was very challenging. It took us a whole year to get 2000 genes in the catalog, right? Because we had to study the articles and see the experimental procedures that were used to validate function or to, to characterize genes. Um, I think that the most important thing to do now is to make the community really uh, commit themselves with the manual curation. So in the case, for instance, of gene annotations in the integrate cost action, we have been uh, doing these uh, hackathons or jamborees, right, of, of gene annotation and manual curation. And we have been uh, spreading guidelines for the whole community across the world to um, manually curate gene models and annotations. We hope that in the case of gene functions for the gene catalog, we do the same. Um, we hope that in the following months, we can um, write a letter of intention to the different journals around uh, the field of uh, grapevine research or plant research for them to um, be in tone, in, in tune with us uh, by at least asking potential articles in the future that will be published to include the data of their genes of interest in the catalog in the same way that it's done for Arabidopsis or other plant model species. When you publish a work regarding the function of a gene in, in Arabidopsis, 
you have to submit that data to Tear, or you have to submit that data to, to different databases. And we hope that the community is able to do that. Because at the end, if you characterize a gene and you name it, you want the other people to use that name that you have uh, given to a gene, right? Based on the, on the roles that you have look for that uh, gene. So I think it's a win-win situation. The community needs to be creator of, of, of this, at least this type of, of, of data. Yeah, 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 that's for sure. Totally agree. So we have a, a question from uh, Michael Allo, and then uh, Aure is also uh, raising his hand for a question. But first, Michael is asking through the chat, Thomas, do you think that it will be feasible to have the gene name in the URL of your gene cards? Um, yeah, I guess that for, for purposes of search, that would be easier, right? Um, Eventually, I think it could it could be possible. Yes, I mean, um, right now, how we have developed the app for the gene cards is that you uh, go inside and you look for each one of the genes, but eventually we can have a gene card that is exportable in an HTML format. In, in that way, it may be easier to uh, integrate it, for instance, in Graypedia, I would say. So th definitely, maybe that could be a good option. Yeah, if I may jump in, uh, I don't know, because that is developed in Shiny, so I'm not really an expert of R. So I don't know how much you can deal with the get, uh, uh, so the query URL. Uh, but for sure, like in, within Grapedia, that will be totally uh, one of the idea in general to have uh, one single URL for each of the entity that will be uh, in, the, in the database. And considering mm -hmm. also the different version that we might have uh, for that specific entity. So this is very, so to have a, a unique identifier, this is something for sure that you are looking forward. And now there is Aure that uh, wants to ask a question. Um, yeah, but Thomas, more than us, is just uh, um, some comment about uh, this idea of sending these requests for journals, asking them, it's not going to work. <laughs> and, and let me tell you my experience from, with like that uh, from the SGN long time ago, when I was working there, trying to ask the journals to ask the community to submit the names and everything else, and, and it didn't work at all. And, and then the journals, of course, say, well, uh, we can try, but then at some point uh, with Arabidopsis, they make the effort also with the Sophila, but mm -hmm. only with five uh, models, or, or model organisms no more than five. And of course they are going to say, yeah, we are not going to do it that because we cannot do it with all the different species that we have. So potentially the, the model that the ZN adopted to fix that problem is a semi-curated model in which people from the database or some, some people working in the database is, read the papers and invite the authors to create their own genes. In, in other words, you have a gene card in which you invite some authors to go there and, and add their information. And of course, the system allows you to place any, any, anything that you add. So also each of these uh, pages potentially can be converted in a, in a, dis in a space for discussion. No? If the two authors say something that, that is an opposite information for the gene, mm -hmm. potentially you can discuss that. Yeah, but asking the journals to 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 to, to ask, not, not only to force or say that it's mandatory, just to ask the authors to do that is, is not going to work. Because yeah, it's or at least my experience is few years ago ago didn't work. And it didn't work for us, for the Solanasi community, and it didn't work for the Rosasi community either. Just yeah, yeah, no, you you may you probably you're right, yes. Uh, I think that the idea that you have given of, of maybe doing workshops or webinars in which the, uh, the, the authors of mm, these articles describing gene functions should be uh, somehow um, committed, yeah, maybe, or, or, or invited to, to do manual curation of the, of the gene catalog and, and to include genes that are being characterized by them. Yeah, definitely, I think that that could be a good option. And, and maybe we can we can offer it through Gradepedia, right? Not necessarily through this first uh, grand year, but in the upcoming years, 
uh, we can offer actually that, that could be a very nice idea to offer instances in which we gather scientists to work on their own genes to add the correct or even as you said uh, contradictory information about genes being characterized as well so yeah I, I think that would that would enrich the database enormously yes as I said this is something that needs to be done from the side of the community rather than from the side of the journals uh, the only thing that the other thing that I can say is that if it's done for the sake of the community, of course you can implement different measures. So you have a common place where you have this information. Sometimes you can do something like the award of the best curated gene every year and give some small prize by the Grapidia community or some kind of something that people in some ways are, are going to like it. But uh, uh, again, it's something you can see some examples in the database. And my experience was that this kind of of approaches work it. Not, not quite well, but at least work in some ways. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a great idea. And, and, and we write it down for the things that we will implement in Gripedia. Very good idea. Thanks, Aure. Yeah, actually, to jump in, uh, we were discussing with some colleagues uh, in Fondazione de Mumac, uh, with uh, Silvia and Laura, uh, about QTL information and genetic mapping uh, information as well, especially because these are pretty historical data, let's say. And so they definitely need to have a, a, an expertise going through all the publication in order to be uh, correctly collected and then, you know, made it available. So this is something that can be done not only for genes, but for different kinds of resources. One last thing is that uh, Paolo suggested that uh, the, the idea of having an idea on, in the URL is totally doable in the, in the Shiny app. So this is something that... Uh, you can ask the video to implement it right away, <laughs> I think. Anyway, so I think that this is time uh, for uh, moving on to the next uh, uh, to the next talk since we have uh, no other questions. So thanks again, Tom. And now it's time uh, for Walter, that is uh, the CEO of Sequentia. And uh, yeah. Walter, yes. if you're ready, it's up. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marco. So I think that you are seeing my screen. Um, so thanks yes. to the last uh, two speakers, we see uh, some resources and tools that we will implement in the Rapidia services. And now let me see that we will speak about the infrastructure or uh, about the solution that we will use to create these new Rapidia services. Um, so, um, as you know, we are the technical partner of this consortium, so we are expert in creating digital products re regarding related to bioinformatics and data and omics data analysis. So, Rapidia is a product, and when you uh, want to create a digital product, you have always to um, link between them two different layers of technology the informatics and the infrastructure layer with the bioinformatics one. So in Grapidia, we will use obviously the last innovation in these fields to create, to create something that will be reliable, secure, and really easy to use. And during the next 15 minutes, I'll share with you some ideas about uh, how we will create the informatic infrastructure and how we will implement the, the tools and the new tools that we will create inside this infrastructure. So let's start from the, the first layer. Uh, when we talk about uh, infrastructure, we, uh, we always have to think that there are three uh, important points that we have to, uh, to, to take in care. The scalability, the flexibility, and the reproducibility of a specific workflow or a specific infrastructure. So as you know, there are uh, a, a war between the on-premises uh, solution and cloud-based solution. On-premise is where when you use a local server and obviously obviously cloud is when you use a, a cloud-based uh, service like Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, and so on. So there are several pros and constraints for uh, both of the two solutions. And we decided to use the cloud-based solution for Grapidia because we know 
that there are many pros and there are many good um, features that we can that are uh, very um, useful for this type of services. When we use on-premise solution, there are some pros that are, for example, the full data control or the full customization that you can create on your server. But there are some big constraints. First of all, the maintenance and acquisition costs. So you have to have an upfront cost because you have to create all your infrastructure. And we are talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of euros. And then most important, we have to, uh, to know and have people that are very expert to handle this type of infrastructure. So in the last year, we know that cloud-based solutions are most and most uh, used, and we will use this cloud-based solution because as you can see from the pros of our cloud solution, we have the easy setup, the low acquisition and maintenance cost, and obviously the scalability and flexibility that we want and we need for the Grapidia services. On the right, there are only an important constraints about the use of a cloud-based solution that is the performance limitation. But there are some tools that can help us to, sorry, that can help us uh, to overcome this type of, uh, of problem. And this solution is called Elastic Computing. So what does it mean, the Elastic Computing? is a system that, for example, we already implement in other solution and that we will implement in Gratidia, where thanks to some machine learning system and, and other informatic tools, you are, you are able to uh, monitoring the traffic inside your platform, automating open and close instances in the cloud to give sufficient power to specific tasks and then load another time this balancing. This is translated in a very elastic and powerful um, solution, saving a lot of money because when there are not users using a specific part of the uh, service, you have most of the cloud flows. And when there are many users that are running an analysis or interact, inter interacting with the same data, we automatically open more power, more instances in the cloud to have the sufficient power to, to, uh, to run the analysis. So the cloud-based solution nowadays is the best system that we can use to create a community and um, um, a system around the uh, VTVD infra data. And the elastic computer inside the, uh, the cloud is the perfect solution for us. Another important, so it, thanks to these um, uh, things, we are able to solve the scalability and flexibility issues. Then there is a very important problem that is the reproducibility. So as you can see from this image that I kept from the uh, uh, a number of national bi biotechnology of 2017, uh, it it uh, seems strange, but when you use a different operating system or a different library, for example, here in a transcript quantification, you have different results. So in bioinformatics, or when you create specific bioinformatics workflow, reproducibility uh, repro, repro becomes a very important issue because if you create a script or a software and you use this software in different server or in different machine, you could have, like uh, I show you in this image, different results. Obviously that there is uh, a system to solve this problem. And these systems are called Dockers and Explore. So we will use these two technology inside Rapidia services to create all the pipeline tools and workflow. And thanks to this system, we will be sure that for all pipeline, but also for databases and software, we will have the 100% of reproducibility on all the different tasks of the platform. What, uh, what is a Docker container? So uh, when you have the infrastructure, you can create a specific software 
inside an infrastructure, or you can create a container, a Docker, and put all your script, all your software, all your depend dependencies inside this container. And when you use this system, you can move the software around different machine operating system or between an on-premise and a cloud-based soft um, infrastructure, and you will have always the same results because this technology, so Docker is a technology, is able to close your script, your software, and protect it against the environment, the informatics environment where this workflow is running. So thanks to Dockers, we will have the 100% of reproducibility, and then we will use Nextflow. Nextflow is a language that is used to create bioinformatics pipeline. And what Nextflow is able to do is to connect the different Dockers between them to create a workflow. The nice thing of use uh, Docker, is in, Docker in combination with, with Nextflow is that Nextflow, Nextflow is able to, with the elastic computing, to modify the size of your instances to keep the correct amount of CPU and RAM and storage that you need to run that specific workflow. So thanks to cloud-based Docker and Nextflow, Nextflow is also a manager to orchestrate and, and to create parallelization inside bioinformatics, we are able to close this circle and, and we are able to have a cloud-based infrastructure that has these three very important features, scalability, flexibility, and reproducibility. On this infra infrastructure, we are able to create the bioinformatic layers. We see, for example, thanks to the Thomas presentation or also thanks to the Marco presentation that we have many different tools already developed for the community and we have many different data. So about the bioinformatics, you know that we are experts to create new uh, system and new software. So what we will do is to keep all our uh, know-how and our knowledge and prosperity in uh, in uh, um, in a joint venture with the Grapidia community to create its specific tool. So from left to right, we will use all our knowledge about and our scripts, obviously, and workflow about the genomics, microbiomics, transcriptomics, and epigenomics part. Then we will use our expertise about the creation of cloud software, and we will create specific Rapidia custom tool in join with the community tools. So after that, we will have many different tools running inside the Graphidia services using obviously data coming from the community. And so this is the, the general overview of our idea to uh, how we would like to create this, um, this service. Marco already explained us how we will uh, keep information from community, how uh, we will standard, uh, we'll standardize this information to have a layer to communicate between the dashboard and the information. And now we will see a little bit what we will have inside the Graphidia services. So as you can see from this slide, we will have three different parts. The web part that is the open and the landing page about the Grapidia services, then we will have the dashboard, and then we will have the workflow. So about the web, obviously, we will use all the last technology like uh, HTML5, uh, JavaScript, and, and so on. So we will have a very advanced user interface that can, that we could be used in any different device. So that will be responsive and obviously we will, we will take care also about the accessibility of this web platform. This is, how can we say, the cover 
of the dashboard. Inside the dashboard, what we will create, thanks to the two layer that I, I'll uh, share with you in the last slide, we will create several data integration and visualization tool. These tools will be free and custom for the community and for all the people that uh, would like to play a little bit with data. We will use all the open source that integration tools that we already know, like GBROS2 and other tools and other visual, visualization, data visualization system. Then we will have a section about tools. So we will create some custom tools. For example, we have one specific tool for long, for the analysis of long non-coding RNAs. Then we will have a tool about the plant resistant genes, other open source tools like Blast, Diamond, and so on. And then inside the same dashboard, we will have all the section about the upload or load sharing data, and obviously the user profile and data management data. This is the second layer that we are developing here. Uh, we are now hosting uh, some people from Valencia, from the group of Aureliano Victor, and we have here in this week weeks with us Marco that is working on this on this platform with us and after these two layers we will work on specific workflow uh, that will allow all researchers to use Rapidia data and run their own analysis or for example integrate their private data with, with Rapidia uh, data. We will use obviously Docker technology, we will create all pipeline index flow. We will create a section where all people, we will download for free all these containers so they can download and use this container. And then thanks to the community coming from Grapidi and thanks to all the people working on this data, we will create more and more tools and workflow that we will be, that we will run in a, a secure and reproducible environment. So this is our, um, our idea uh, that we are sharing with you. We are now uh, working on this specific section. There are people working on all on this aspect. And I hope that we will have uh, soon a better version to, to show you all this uh, technical advances. So thank you very much for your attention. So thanks a lot, uh, Walter, for a very nice talk. And um, we don't have question from uh, from the attendees at the moment. So while uh, I don't know if there is someone in the chat, not yet, but um, I don't know, Tomas, you have a question. Otherwise, I have a question. Um, no, not really a question, but uh, a, a comment on, on uh, the impressive amount of new things that are, are available and that uh, can be used to, to create a uh, very dynamic, uh, you know, database and portal to, to, to offer to the community. Uh, if, we, if we look at the, the, the model systems, you know, like that have been developed 10 years ago, like Tear for Rapidopsis, which are very helpful, but don't have this dynamic interface on their kind, not rely on, on, uh, on, on such amazing new technologies and platforms. So I think that it's uh, really exciting to, to be at the precise time to create Grapedia. Yeah, you know what, I, I will jump in because I, <laughs> sorry to hijack your comments, but I was exactly about to do more or less the same comments since uh, when when I was started. And uh, I mean, we are more or less, we are young, right? We are more or less the same age. And uh, I mean, it, it's an amazing time to be alive, let's say, for doing bioinformatics. Because even though uh, Walter mentioned a lot of technology that might sound uh, alien for biologists, they are actually really, really helpful, and uh, they helps a lot uh, in making things uh, easier. So to me, 
the technical aspect uh, it's really way 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 more easier today even though it seems is more complex because there are more uh, possibilities but once you know which are the technologies that are available putting things together are from the technical point of view uh, way easier so to me the complication is really pushed more towards uh, you know the data curation of course uh, and then the actual manual uh, labor that you have to do because a lot of these things actually again might sound uh, strange or things that we don't know how to handle uh, like scalability and docker containers and uh, workflows uh, but in reality they are meant to be simple to use and so just with a little bit of technical information you can do really amazing things that were really difficult uh, if you have to do it by hand so the real problem uh, to me, at least, uh, it, it's moving towards, uh, you know, the actual creation of the community. Again, data creation is really important and uh, uh, to be sure that uh, the data are really uh, valuable. And uh, so what do you think? I... Yeah, no, and if I can have a comment, it's very important to share with all the people join this community that we will not reinvent the wheels, but we will use all data coming from the tools created by uh, other uh, groups like Thomas and other groups only to improve the re reliability or the usage of this information. So what we will do is a technological transformation, but we will expect that the community we, we will, will help us a lot to identify the specific uh, information and data integration that we will uh that, that we will have to push a little bit more you know yes there is a comment from Michael Allo that says uh, uh, if uh, you use a private computing cloud system such as uh, the Amazon cloud I think that it is important to work uh, on open access data only Yeah, so sure. per per perhaps I can I can yeah, I can say can. a bit a bit more. It's, it's just to be sure to avoid yeah. any um, data property issue. So I think, uh, but I think uh, Gripedia will work on open access uh, the, 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 the data. So I think I I yeah. I, I think it's uh, it's it's okay. But per per perhaps if if you give some functionalities for the users to upload their their uh, their own data. They have to be. They have to know that they upload their uh, own data on, on a, uh, on a, a private solution. Yeah. Well, we obviously. You mean we... when they perform their analysis? Oh, sorry, sorry about that. No, no, please, please go ahead. I was just to ask uh, if I understood correctly. You mean when? Uh, so if people upload their data in the cloud, you mean for performing some sort of analysis? Yeah. Yes. If the if the if you give the the functionality to people to users to upload their own private data in addition of the public uh, data available, yes, they have to to be aware that they're uploading their uh, data on a private company uh, solution. Yeah, uh, but um, obviously the cloud will be of property of the Rapidia community. So it will be not a private cloud. We will only the partner that are helping Rapidia to create it, but uh, it will be not property of the of a private company. It will be open source, public. And so maybe we will solve this issue in this way. Uh, but yes, we will think we will think about it. Yeah, but okay, the, the the issue is not is not your your, your company, uh, uh, Walter. But it could be uh, Amazon. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we will take care about it. Now, now I I, I understand. Well, I guess that that problem is also like if you put your stuff on Dropbox, no, maybe Dropbox. I don't know actually for sure the the free part or in Google Drive. I mean, it's always the same problem. Like as soon as it's somewhere it's not on your PC, I mean, of course, you have to take into consideration that you might not be the only one looking at that data. 
So we have a question actually from Claudia that is asking, have you considered to develop a, a feature on Grapedia to perform GVAS? Yeah, this is a very interesting um, topic because obviously we are uh, thinking about many different workflow and one of them uh, would be a GWAS analysis. But uh, as we said in the last slides, we will uh, open this request to all the Grapidia community. So our idea is to create like a questionnaire or a, um, an open page uh, to um, ask to all the people working with this data, which are the most important tool that they want to have on this platform. But GWAS or uh, and other tools we are thinking, transcriptomics and other pipeline, I am quite sure that uh, will be present in the in the new version of Grapidia. Thanks, Walter. Uh, yeah, maybe to add a little bit on that, this is really important. Uh, also, let's say from the developer point of view, um, you know, to have a, a a coherent, let's say, architecture in order to be easy for anyone. Uh, to develop something else uh, according to that uh, uh, architecture. And this is exactly what we are trying to do. So if you have uh, like a new resources, it should be easy uh, to write down the code in order to make it integrated uh, within the Grapedia. If you have an idea about uh, a specific uh, pipeline or analysis or a way to represent information on how to uh, integrate different information to perform another specific uh, analysis, uh, this is something that uh, should be easy, let's say, to develop uh, and open to anyone. This is also because like all the code uh, that we are going to develop uh, will be, of course, open source uh, and will be documented uh, for the users uh, as well as uh, for developers. So there are no other uh, questions. I don't know if uh, someone on uh, of the panelists uh, have... Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, I think, uh, Thomas, what do you think? We can close this session then? And, yeah, uh, we can close on. this session, go to a very short coffee break and come back uh, in uh, 40 minutes, a little bit less than 40 minutes and um, wait for the last two talks. The, the first one would be a talk by Dario Cantu and then just a round table regarding the ongoing scientific missions uh, for the Greatpedia um, starting uh, grant period. And, and that would be. So um, bye bye. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks to the speakers of this session, to Walter, to Marco, and uh, hope that um, our attendees have uh, learn a little bit more on the solutions that are planned or the different ways in which the Greatpedia portal can uh, achieve its implementation. This is, of course, uh, topics for still discussion and we're still uh, looking at the different types of data sources that we want to include. Uh, that is why we, we created the survey. So we, we are considering the, the needs for the community and I hope that uh, at least the, the first pilot or demo will be available next year for, for uh, basically uh, experimenting the, the database of the portal and, and uh, improving it later on. So thank you very much again uh, for your presence and see you in, uh, in some uh, half an hour.
The Grapevine Genomics Encyclopedia is a web portal that converges different sources of open access data, integrating biological knowledge, genetic and genomic resources, and customised services for the entire Grapevine scientific community and industry, including researchers and companies from different fields related to grapevine cultivation. Due to its economical importance, grapes are an agricultural commodity. In 2020, vineyards destined for the production of table grapes, raisins, wines or other products occupied more than 7 million hectares of land worldwide. Scientifically speaking, grapes are an excellent model for other crops. This is mainly due to research generated around the vitis species. Being the fourth plant with its genome to ever be sequenced, the amount of next generation sequencing data being produced in grapes positions its research community in the hotspot for genomic resources. Despite the huge amount of public data available, these resources are now dispersed, and most of them are not interoperable. Our community needs to grow strong and united to take full advantage of all resources being generated. The information we can gather on plant phenotypes and omics resources has an enormous potential when facing challenges of the near future, like global warming, pathogen resistance, and sustainability. The possibility to design new cultivars able to cope with environmental transitions and pests and ensure eco-friendly cultivations depends on how we use all these resources. The Grapedia initiative is an outcome of the Cost Action Integrate which has greatly contributed in providing the ground basis for the integration of grape resources. Integrape has generated guidelines for the fair treatment and generation of standardised data, allowing them to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Integrape has contributed towards the release of the latest and most updated reference genome assembly of grape together with the world's largest gene catalogue of functional data and has also served as a hub of tools for data exploration and analysis. Despite these advances, there is still much room for improvement. These in-house resources do not fully interoperate, neither are they linked to other important highly accessed resources generated by the community, such as the grapegenomics.com portal or the Transcriptomics Data Exploratory Tool Vespucci, among many others. In Grapedia, we aim to integrate and intercommunicate these resources, offering them to the community in an innovative, dynamic and centralised portal. Grapedia will work as an open access platform, allowing worldwide access, thus guaranteeing global impact. Grapedia will allow the user to explore and visualise data in multiple forms, helping researchers and the community to elaborate new hypotheses and plan new experiments. Grapedia will have a user-friendly interface and will be fully equipped with tools and software designed for our community to ensure the best benefit. And finally, Grapedia will count on a commercial exploitation plan, allowing its own sustainability while allowing it to grow. Implementing Grapedia will be based on three main pillars. The community, generating an exhaustive amount of data of different types and nature. The Grapedia Federative Database, which will collect this data, pre-process it to make it readable and organize it into modules. The services of graphical, interactive, and exportable nature, some of which will be free while others will be customised and offered at a fee. Examples include browser navigators, dashboards and experimental workflows. These services will be offered back to our widely diverse community, whether they are people working in research to those in industry. Our community will benefit from tailored application programming interfaces and implement innovative technologies such as deep learning and artificial intelligence methods, proving the best tools to face near-future challenges.
In building Grapedia, we need to be strong and unified. Despite the many achievements as a community, we are still dispersed. The awarded Cost Innovators Grant will provide network building tools for the first year of implementation. Nevertheless, we need your help for long-term maintenance, growth and expansion of this portal. The support of both the research and industry fields is necessary to implement Grapedia, whereas your support will be essential to embrace the continuing development because the future of Grape relies on us, the community. Welcome everybody back again in our, our almost end point of our kickoff meeting. We are again, I, I will not uh, end saying this, very happy and excited of, of, of the amazing attendance. Uh, we have a lot of people from all around the world, from the States, from South America, from Europe, uh, from South Africa, from uh, Australia, from China, India, and Japan. And uh, we hope that we have been able to give you some very nice overview of the Gripedia project and also on the um, resources that are available in Grapevine and also in the databases um, and how these databases in other species have been constructed or have been built. Um, this is a challenging task for, for us as a community to gather, to integrate, but I think it's the right and appropriate time to do it. So I invite you once again to everyone that is uh, right now listening and for the ones that will be listening in, in the, re uh, the recordings, that please contact us if you want to join either as ambassadors or for giving data or just to put your hands and, and, and be guinea pigs uh, for testing the different pilots that we create during this uh, 12 months of secret period. I would like, uh, before we start, to thank again uh, all the organizers, the sponsors, all the panelists and, and the attendant, attendees. So um, we have right now our last part of the, of the kickoff meeting. Um, basically, we have um, scientific missions, uh, ongoing scientific missions that will be um, uh, that are currently ongoing for the Grapedia implementation. Uh, basically, we have the scientific mission of Marco Moreto that is has come from FEM to Sequencia Biotech um, to start with the first steps on the implementation. And also we have Victor, Victor Garcia coming from IBM CP to um, Sequencia Biotech as well to assist also and work also in the, in the first steps of the implementation. We were gonna do a, um, a small change in the agenda. So we will talk about first these scientific missions and uh, I leave the stage to, to Marco. There is also um, Marco from Sequencia Biotech um, I don't know if he's around, I don't know if he will be able to, to join us, but the idea would be more or less to briefly comment on the activities that you have been doing during these uh, weeks or the plan activities for, for, uh, for the implementation, right? Yeah, that's Mark. correct. Yeah, Hello. Mark, hi, hi everybody. Hi. everybody. Nice, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah, so uh, talking about the idea and the stuff that we are going right now, uh, as Marco is going to tell us later, and as already Walter said to us during his talk, uh, we are following a really deep and uh, interesting flow on the uh, workflow. And uh, right now uh, we have uh, Marco that is uh, more concentrated on the part of the REST API, fast API, and uh, evaluation with database and data that we can use. And Victor is more related on the part that is involved in the ETL and um, uh, thinking function of the data. Uh, in the meantime, we are also uh, evaluating uh, strategies to um, utilize 
practice a different method like um, next flow pipeline and uh, the usage of Docker containers in order to uh, give the user the possibility to uh, perform his own analysis and also to uh, integrate uh, many other tools uh, to the portal, to the dashboard and so on in order to give a, a, a user-friendly way the possibility to analyze their own data or to visualize data that we already have but also to uh, create uh, um, new workflows, a new pipeline, a new kind of uh, new different kind of analysis that um, also user can uh, can perform in a very customizable way. Uh, given that we have already uh, a lot of idea, and we will really appreciate the um, idea that uh, will come from the community to give us the opportunity to um, give to the scientific uh, to the scientific people and the group of research and other community the possibility to interact with us and uh, give us the opportunity to offer you uh, the best portal uh, on GetBind that uh, we could have. Thank you very much, Marco. I, I think welcome. that um... Sequencia has right now all the, the stage for, for helping and assisting us, the Great Bank community, in, in creating the best possible and most uh, useful resource or platform to integrate all the resources. So we are very happy to have Sequencia on board. Um, we also have um, organized in, in, in the near future a training school, right, by, by Sequencia. So we yeah. hope that some of the APIs or some of the software that can be included in the database somehow will be created during this training school. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. Um, Marco Moreto, if you are around, maybe we can uh, briefly yep. comment on, on, on your uh, activities and what do you think are the following steps for, for the implementation? Sure. Just let me uh, start. I, I prepared actually a few slides. Uh, so since uh, it... okay, so I can bore you to death since I'm. I mean, you're all exhausted about hearing me talking today. But anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, so as um, as Thomas said. I'm actually not in uh, Fondazione Edmund Mach at the moment. I'm uh, here in uh, in Barcelona, in, uh, in hosted by Sequencia. And uh, let me say that I'm really happy to be here because it's an amazing place. It's really a vibrating environment. I really enjoyed a lot of my, my staying here. And um, But my mission was essentially uh, to start uh, and try to have an idea about the basis, uh, the technical basis to be... Uh, to be, to be the beginning part of, of the whole infrastructure. So there are a few goals that we had in mind when, when we started this uh, uh, STSM. They are essentially to evaluate, evaluate which are the different technologies that we might use for the architecture. And uh, that, that is the one uh, that I talked about also during my talk about Vespucci. To see which might be the best technology since as i said also like in commenting what walter was saying um, that there's a lot of technologies out there that are essentially ready to be used and we just need to grab the right tools in order to achieve what we want and uh, of course we will need to test the different solution and uh, try out to, to fast prototype in different solutions in order to you know check and see which might actually work in the long term considering which are actually solutions that might be feasible in the long term, uh, considering maintainability and scalability. Scal scalability especially, it's, uh, it, it's a problem more uh, related to the deployment uh, of, uh, of the applications or something that Walter also uh, mentioned when he was talking about the Elasticsearch uh, infrastructure. And talking about maintainability, it's more related to uh, the development, let's say, part uh, in which uh, as a developer, we need also to take uh, always into consideration that uh, what we design now might uh, change during the future. So we, we have to be careful about uh, uh, the design choice uh, that, that we do. 
And, uh, and the last part is uh, uh, to establish, let's say, uh, guidelines about uh, the application program interface, uh, because this will be essentially the layer that shows the data model, the integrated data model of all the resources uh, outside, essentially. And that will be the, the single point of access, let's say, to the data model uh, underneath the graphia and will be used server i think there is someone with the mic open um anyway so it's the common interface to everything else so um it has to be easy to use and it's, it has to be consistent it has to represent a, a really complex set of different entities and it has to be scalable as well because it might evolve uh, during time and as I said it will serve as uh, the single point of access to all the other applications so all the other front-end application that might be of course uh, the the web portal the dashboards uh, as well as the workflows uh, that Marco Di Marsico was talking about and speaking about uh, the <clears throat> sorry uh, speaking about the infrastructure this is the same slide that I show you a couple of times and uh, the different choices that we made about the technology to use uh, are related to the ATL, so the extract transform load uh, software layer that we're going to use in order to extract information from, uh, uh, let's say, file data sources that might be FASTA file, GFF file, everything related to genomes or other genetic information. We're going to use Airbyte uh, since it's an open source, uh, um, freely available tool, and, uh, and also because it's written in Python. And uh, this is a kind of uh, easy, of course, for me, uh, but in the scientific community in general, because uh, it's one of the most used uh, programming languages. So there's a lot of resources around that. And um, considering the API, uh, we decided to move uh, uh, using a fast API as a tool together with uh, Strawberry, that is uh, another package uh, uh, developed in Python. Essentially, the whole, uh, the whole architecture, most of that, uh, will be developed in Python. But in any case, uh, the nice part ab about uh, the, the GraphQL API is that uh, it's agnostic uh, in the sense of the programming language that will be used uh, to actually use that. So all the services might be written in whatever language uh, anyone is more uh, comfortable with. Uh, so all the different application might be developed using R or PHP or any other programming language. Moving a little bit, since, uh, as I said, I'm here in Sequenza together with, with uh, Victor, uh, that is working in the Aureliano uh, lab, and also Marco Di Marsico, that is uh, uh, working here in, in Sequenza. Uh, we spent, uh, of course, a few time uh, in, in meetings and tried to decide uh, how to divide uh, the different tasks that we have, the different uh, work to do, and the different things to try out. So. At the moment, Victor is mostly involved uh, in uh, the development of the Python packages that are needed to work uh, uh, within uh, the Airbyte software layer in order to be able to extract information from general file. And uh, that is our standards, of course, uh, in terms of uh, bioinformatics standard, like FASTA and GFF uh, or gene annotation and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this is something that we need to instruct uh, Airbyte how to properly do. And uh, once that is done, we will have those information inside uh, our uh, database. And we will move on in actually showing up uh, all this information in a more coherent uh, way. And this is something that I am most involved with uh, for the moment. Uh, that is essentially to integrate uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, everything into a unified uh, uh, application programming interface. Uh, so integrating also other programs uh, with their API, such as Vespucci, of course, uh, since uh, he has uh, his own API that I developed, so I know pretty much how it works. And, uh, and of course, to show a coherent data model uh, for anything related to gene and all the gene-related information, so genomes uh, and, uh, and everything else. Uh, while Marco Di Marsico is uh, at the moment uh, mostly involved uh, in, the, in the part related to workflows, so the development of uh, Nextflow as well as Docker files uh, for uh, workflows uh, uh, that will, will be used within uh, Gripedia together with uh, the data that will come directly from the Gripedia API and as well as data that might be provided uh, by users. So 
uh, is currently testing different pipelines. Uh, and uh, one of the first will be uh, an NGS pipeline, and uh, as well as the integration of uh, the different uh, tools uh, that Sequentia already provide uh, freely available for everyone, and how to integrate uh, this tool together with uh, uh, a Nextflow uh, workflow. And I think this is it, this is it more or less. Uh, and uh, let me thank uh, again uh, all the people here in Sequentia, especially Walter and Ricardo for uh, essentially having me here. It was really a pleasure to work uh, with him. It was really nice actually also to have the possibility to uh, meet Marco and, uh, uh, and Fulvio. Um, it was really amazing working with them and I cannot see, I mean, uh, it will be awesome to keep working uh, with them, of course. And again, from the CAG, thanks to Jerome and Marie and, uh, and Tomas. And of course, thanks a lot also to Victor. It was a, a pleasure to meet him and to start to work with him. And uh, and thank you all. And I think we can start uh, on discussing on that. Thanks again. Thanks, Marco. Um, I don't know if there's any questions right now. Um, I don't see any questions, but if you have any questions, please uh, drop them in the Q&A. Um, I was wondering, Marco, whether the- Wait, this... which, which Marco? Ah, Marco Moretto. Oh, okay. Okay, Marco Di Marsico, bo bo both of you. So eventually we, we have set right now a series of uh, first resources to, to integrate, right? Uh, yes, exactly. So um, what would be the next steps after that? Will The best thing would be maybe to test this first pilot to integrate other resources or sources of data. Um, what, what do you think could be the next what, steps? Yeah, yeah. What, what we're going to do is, uh, of course, to try to integrate at the moment uh, the easy part, let's say. So all the genomic information that we have uh, that are mostly related to the PN 424, of course, so together with the gene annotation and essentially all the information that has been provided by uh, also the integrate uh, cost action, so the gene nomenclature and all that information. We're going to test also um, the front end part that um, uh, it's still uh, uh, it, it's something that we decided how to do, but uh, we still have actually to deploy a first test, but that will be essentially based on Node.js. Uh, again, it's JavaScript. I mean, it, it's pretty uh, well known in the development uh, world, let's say. Uh, but for sure, it will be essentially to have a, a, a first set of small application, um, let's say, to work within uh, the newly uh, created infrastructure. And uh, and actually, one of the first thing we would like to try to implement, of course, are the Vitis Bits. Uh, um, applications so essentially to have uh, the same functionalities uh, but within uh, a different uh, um, style okay uh -huh. so taking the advantages of every everything in a single place uh, with uh, uh, a more easy way to go back and forth from different uh, solution that's for sure and as well as as of course testing uh, the workflows that Marco is uh, is testing right now great great um, then moving to, to the uh, different training schools that we will have during next year, I guess that we will have the chance also to, to test them in, in, uh, in situ, right? And make the, the attendees, the trainees of this training school also to, to work and, and to improve maybe the, the prototype, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, so, uh, of course, I will speak about uh, the training school uh, that we are going to organize uh, in Fondazione de Mumac uh, in June next year. And uh, the idea is, of course, uh, to start to actually work, uh, so to put in our hands in uh, what will be uh, the first prototype of the old rapid infrastructure in order uh, to allow people to see how they can perform a simple analysis using uh, the, uh, the old rapid infrastructure, of course, as well as a more in-deep uh, um, description on how anyone can contribute uh, depending on his knowledge uh, and is willing to do of course so if someone has uh, new resources that we would like to integrate in our uh, in our infrastructure how that is possible 
And uh, if there is a new analysis uh, uh, or a new workflows, uh, um, how that will be possible to be integrated within Grepedia and, and so on. So together will be, let's say, both uh, from uh, the simple user point of view and also moving a little bit towards uh, the development uh, point of view, but considering the, uh, the contribution that anyone can give. So also simply testing out uh, application or giving ideas uh, about um, what might be useful as a new tool, uh, it, it's already a nice contribution, as well as uh, the data curation. Again, I, I know I'm repeating that part uh, pretty a lot, but to me, it's fundamental. It's really, it's, yeah. uh, it, it, it's the only thing that actually makes sense uh, is to have uh, a, a decent data set because uh, it's more about related the, the quality of the data and not much about the data. Uh, so the quantity of the data, of course. So it's really, really important. So um, in, in this part, uh, it will be nice uh, also to have ideas uh, and, uh, and people contributing uh, in the, you know, with their time about improving the quality of the data itself uh, as soon as they see that something is not uh, uh, is not quite right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think that it's super important to stress out, to highlight the, the need for curation and that we need the community in, in, in this task, right? Uh, I also wanted to, to ask uh, Marco Di Marsico if um, the, the experience in API development in, in Sequencia, uh, all these tools that are already available, um, somehow they will be customized for grapevine researchers, right? So for instance, you have uh, transcriptomic data analysis uh, tools and metagenomic uh, software tools as well. Um, how easy would it be to adapt them only to Grapevine within Grapevine? Well, we really we have a really good expertise on that, and I don't think that it will require a lot of time. Uh, we already have been work, uh, talking with uh, Marco and Walter about this um, this topic, and we are really pretty confident that we might have um, pretty soon um, interfaces and um, tools that will give the, the user the opportunity to, to, to perform this kind of analysis and perform this kind of, uh, to use this kind of tools. Very well, very well. We are, we are excited to, to see them implemented. And we know that in one year, we, we, we are asking a lot, right? To, to generate a lot of uh, um, software develop, to be developed and APIs, but I think that with the incredible, uh, incredible help of, of you guys in Sequencia, we can we can achieve this. Um, we are uh, almost at the end of our uh, kickoff meeting, and I would like again to thank this time uh, the the people doing the scientific missions, uh, Marco Moreto, Victor Garcia, and the hosts, right, Marco Di Marsico and and Walter San Severino at Sequencia. I, I envy these guys because they are uh, learning a lot in, in, in Sequencia, and I know that they are in really, really good hands. So uh, thank you once again for, for being hosts of these first short-term scientific missions for the Grapedia uh, project. And thank you very much to, to let us work with and for you. <laughs> thanks, thanks. So um, everyone, uh, we are almost in the end of our kickoff meeting. And now we have the, the presentation of, of Dario. Dario, thank you very much for, for attending. I know that it's a, a big uh, time difference between uh, California Davis and, and, and CET timeframe. So we really, really thank you for, for making the effort in being present. Um, we have been uh, commenting to the attendees in in during the whole day that the whole session is being recorded. So uh, even though with these difficulties of time zones, uh, everybody will be able to, to watch the, the presentations and, and uh, see the, our discussions around Repedia in the following days. So thank you very much for, for being present. And um, if, you, if it's okay with you, I'll leave you for, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Tom, and I'm sorry for the misunderstanding.
Uh, oh no 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 worry at all. My, we, are, we are in time. I was I was ready to present in an hour and a half. I, my calendar <laughs> was still there, so I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, I try to be brief. I know you had a long day, and uh, I wish I was there, but you know I also need to sleep sometimes. So, <laughs> uh, do you see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Yes. Do you see it in a presenter mode, or do I need to swap? Uh, you need to swap. Okay. There Good. you go. Okay, so. Um, Again, I will try to be as brief as possible. And my goal, my goals here are two. I would say one is uh, just remind about all the other genomic resources that uh, are out there and um, that also my group has been uh, um, generating. Um, the ways we've been sharing those resources and how, as part of Grapedia, we would like to in integrate our, um, you know, genomics uh, with. Uh, the available tool and, and and the new tools that uh, Tom and, and the others will be developing. Um, so, just you know, uh, a reminder of the the good times we're all living. An explosion of uh, genomic resources in the past ten years, going from you know the availability of just uh, PN for 0024 and PN noir in the 2007, and then uh, an exponential increase of what is available for not only vinifera, but also for rabbitis species that are of um, very importance for, for breeding and understanding uh, biotic and abiotic stress responses in grapes. Um, this uh, explosion of genomes has been really the, the consequence or the result of technological advances. Um, and uh, just a reminder, you know, long read sequencing has been really the, um, the key development, I would say, that really allowed uh, the new wave of grape genomics and as well as integration with other technologies. And this is just a, an outline of what we have been doing until, uh, until very recently when uh, uh, we sequence and assemble genomes of grapes where part biosequencing on one side, optical maps on the other, and uh, tools that allow hybrid assembly of diploid uh, genomes. I said until recently because uh, the high fidelity reads that Pacbio uh, can generate now really have changed uh, dramatically in the past one year, uh, one year and a half, the way we do genomes, where we, um, I would say the bioinformatics side of uh, assemblies has been simplified very much because the quality of the context we generate uh, by using um, hi-fi reads is really uh, amazing. So some, some contexts are, are either um, chromosome arm scale or sometimes even chromosome scale. So the, the degree of uh, downstream quality control and, uh, and uh, scaffolding is minimal. However, we still need to integrate genetic maps and other information to be able to develop um, chromosome scale assemblies for uh, the diploid uh, genomes. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, move. Uh, so what we have learned uh, by by doing uh, genomics is really the, the the degree and extent of uh, of uh, structural variability across genotypes, across species, and across uh, varieties within vinifera. What I'm showing here is just a picture of a recent project that we have been carrying on carried on on um, uh, vitis uh, species, North American vitis species genomic diversity. And you know, the more genomes you, you sequence, the more you realize that the core genome, the 100% conserved genome is actually uh, declined, the more genome you have. And what it becomes more and more uh, interesting and relevant for understanding the genetic diversity is really those stretches of DNA sequences that are variable across genomes and those that are actually unique to, to genomes. And those stretches of uh, dispensable or private genomes are actually uh, enriched for uh, um, transposable elements. So they're really evidence of recent uh, evolutionary patterns, but they are also gene rich. Eh? They are not as gene dense as the rest of the genome, but there are genes in those regions. And oftentimes those regions that are not shared across all genomes are important for uh, um, local adaptation and, and stresses, uh, stress responses, et cetera. So they're very important and I'm, I'm highlighting them here to uh, make again the case that uh, multiple genome references complicate our lives, but they're also very important because oftentimes traits that we are trying to understand are driven by genes that are not shared by all genomes. And therefore, in order to identify genes responsible for traits of interest, we need to study the right genome and we cannot rely only on a single reference. Um, 
the other thing we have learned by doing grape genomics is the degree of uh, uh, heterozygosity. And this is, you know, it should be logical considering the degree of uh, variability across genomes, uh, being grapes, F1s of other uh, genotypes, well, uh, they, are, um, they are highly heterozygous. And what I'm showing here is uh, some, some um, uh, overage of structural variability between homologous chromosome across uh, some, uh, some cultivars of vinifera and some North American species. And you can see the number is, is quite important and uh, quite high, you think about other plant species that have been characterized. So 20% of, of, of genomes being um, structurally variant uh, between homologous chromosomes, which again suggests that uh, heterozygosity is important, should not be a disregard. I understand the value of creating homologous consensus genomes, but on the other hand, if we are dealing with uh, heterozygous um, traits, for example, you need to be able to observe uh, heterozygosity and use heterozygous information to draw conclusions about the genetic role of, of uh, genomic loci. Um, so what we've been trying to do and what we've done for several genomes is to develop uh, diploid references. Uh, and what I'm showing here is a uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, where for each chromosome we have uh, we have two copies of each chromosome, and this uh, and the results of this is that we double uh, the gene content for every single chromosome. And again, just for Cabernet Sauvignon, the idea here is that by um, separating the haplotypes and reconstructing the haplotypes, we can see the alleles inherited from Cabernet, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And every variety will have the same, the same situation where alleles actually are uh, derived from, from separate and very distinct uh, parents. And therefore, the information that they carry is very important if, you, if you're looking for genetic basis of traits. Um, and uh, you know, for us, it was very important to have diploid genome to reconstruct the highly heterozygous um, uh, sex determining regions in grapes, um, the male, the female, and hermaphrodite uh, um, uh, loci are very structurally distinct. And uh, in PN4024, we only had access, despite the fact that Pino was, uh, is uh, heterozygous hermaphrodite, we only had access to the female haplotype. And uh, so until, until we developed heterozygous genomes, diploid genomes for uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, where we have both the female and hermaphrodite allele uh, resolved, we were not able to see the genes responsible for male fertility, for example, and, uh, and, and identify candidates, et cetera. Uh, in disease resistance, we're also discovering that um, observing and, and preserving heterozygotic is very important. And this is just one example in muscadine grapes in, a, in an accession tray shed. We have two loci of resistance to powdery mildew. Both loci confer uh, dominant resistance to powdery mildew. However, uh, despite the fact being the phenotype being homozygous uh, in the crosses, the, the, both loci are highly heterozygous with different uh, uh, content in, uh, in um, uh, receptor kinases, in the receptor um, MBS uh, genes. And, uh, and therefore, I would say that this is one accession with four uh, loci of resistance and not just two. And again, we would not be able to see this without a genome dedicated to Treshed and resolved uh, in deployed fashion. And we're doing this on several uh, um, cultivars of grapes. Some of them have already been released and available in, on our website. Some other uh, are finished, but not yet uh, released for, for different reasons. Some obvious reasons, of course, but so, so. some uh, still need some polishing and not ready yet. And uh, as I mentioned, we also, um, our effort has also spanned um, some um, of the North American variety species and some of the Chinese uh, Asian variety species. And most of our work is done in relationship to um, abiotic stress tolerance, um, salt tolerance in particular, and uh, powdery mildew resistance, both in North American and Asian, Asian uh, species. And uh, we recently released two uh, diploid genomes for uh, three important rootstocks of grapes. Um, and this is the first article where we describe, uh, our group describes at least uh, hi-fi based assemblies. And, um, and again, uh, this is the future. I know our genome center, for example, does not run anymore CLR uh, sequences. So 
uh, hi-fi is, is the future and is, is it looks looks good uh, it's, it's going to be um, faster and easier to build uh, chromosome scale genomes um, which is uh, which means that everybody can have one without not much of, of an effort um, and uh, um, as we were generating genomes we also um, uh, developed a web portal where uh, genomes that we generate and others uh, that are willing to share uh, with us generated um, are hosted uh, grapegenomics.com and here we have for each uh, um, for each uh, genome we have a ded dedicated page with very simple tools and uh, very primitive I would say but uh, enough for a list of what we need to do in the lab which is you know most of the time is blasting and um, browsing genomes with uh, with genome browsers and I guess for most of you guys out there the most important part is actually the download page where all, all genomes are accessible for download so you can upload on your own servers and play with the genomes um, and um, what I'm showing here is the page of Cabernet Sauvignon uh, the other thing we would like to do is to extend once more the invitation of others to submit their genomes um, you know, we will always credit the the producers of the genome, so that's not uh, something you should not be concerned about. Uh, but the idea here is the more genome we have, the more comparative uh, work we can do. Um, and if, if you follow on the on the website and click on submit your genome, you will find the information we need to host uh, genomes from others. And again, this the point I wanted to make here that we are building tools to be able to do comparative genomics within great genomics and therefore the more genomes we have the better it is the more the more effective will be the uh, the type of analysis we can carry out and these are some of the tools we're developing using the new release of um, of uh, jbrowse we can now connect um, haplotypes uh, within a diploid genome so between species between cultivars um, by using uh, synthetic information both at the sequence level and the gene level and uh, literally, we, this allows us to link uh, browsers in pairwise uh, relationship, so we can jump from one genome to another easily. And, uh, um, and this information can also be accessed uh, through the gene cards, where every gene will have links to uh, the synthetic the synthetic pairs, as well as uh, um, as uh, what we would like to do with Carpedia. Uh, links to the PN40024 gene, genes within the Grapidia um, framework. And that's uh, you know, my, my last slide here. Literally, we would like to have grape genomics interfacing directly uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Grapidia. So uh, on one hand, we don't need to generate all the fancy tools that Tom et, et al. are producing. And uh, on the other hand, we, it would be nice to be able to jump from PN to the uh, orthologs in, uh, in vitis and in vinifera and, um, and, and you know, carry out all the comparative genomic work within uh, grape genomics. And I think I'm done with this. I know I went fast and not so many slides and um, hopefully there are questions and still somebody's around here. I don't see anybody. <laughs> Thanks Dario, uh, uh, very, very nice presentation. I think that it's, uh... Um, very interesting. Many people uh, that is attending now might be really interested in accessing these genomes. I think that the fact that you have the information on both haplotypes and that you can navigate um, the differences at the gene content level and at specifically the structural variants between the haplotypes is really interesting. Um, I, I wanted to ask you regarding the the, uh, the annotations you have for each one of the of the genome assemblies or genome references that you are creating. Uh, is there any uh, in interest in in doing manual curation of the of the genes, um, being compared between the haplotypes, but also compared to the other um, to the other accessions? Basically, in the sense that if these are manual or not a manual sorry automatic annotations maybe they they need some fine manual curation right yeah you're totally right and uh, uh, i had one slide about that and i removed it because i thought it was not relevant but you know i'm almost always or most of the time around when i do that um uh yeah you're totally right so what we do is you know uh, is an effort to produce the best models 
by not manually correcting every single gene in the genome. And uh, all the calls are based on evidence. So we use both RNA-seq, ISO-seq, and uh, all the information that is in NCBI related to grapes for, uh, for calling gene models. But we know that there are you know, plenty of uh, uh, errors to, to tell you the truth i mean and 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 if you if you do manu, if you do gene prediction you're not surprised about error rates you know that's it's part of the game you're playing um i'm not telling you that we're going to be uh, curating and producing new releases of um of uh, gene models like you're doing for pn because we don't have the resources and uh and our interest is actually on the genome scale uh, so the more genome, the better, and the more genome means the less uh, opportunity we have to curate every single gene in every genome. Uh, so that, uh, you know, if we can start actually working as a community and there mm -hmm. is an effort, you know, I, you know, I'm, we manually create the low side that we're interested in. So uh, you may have a bias of quality, you know, in the sex determining locus, for example, in gene resistant loci, where actually we do manual curation. Um, but I know, you know, other people are interested in other loci. And if if we treat, you know, these uh, resources we're developing as part of Grapidia, as part of my own group, et cetera, as a community resources, we are very welcome to, you know, accept, um, you know, updated GFFs or, uh, you know, FASTA files with, with updated G models for, for uh, improving uh, gene calls. I cannot promise you know, and oftentimes happens, you know, the people complain, you know, like, Dario, the gene I'm working on, the exon is missing. Yeah, well, yeah, bad for you, but what can I do about that? I mean, this is... Well, in, in, in PN400, there has been a long process also. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think that this is important also to do, especially the, the comparative genomics and to compare gene structure and, and see these differences, right, in the, in the core genes, in the pan uh, genome genes and... and, and to see the really the real differences and 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 not differences that are due to uh, annotation issues, but to real you know uh, uh, real differences between the genomes. I yeah. think that yeah, and the more genomes, the more genome, the more uh, they will self correct because gene models so, are very conserved. Yeah. Uh, like I think that one important thing to consider is that for for those people which in the future are interested in characterizing gene families or genes uh, to not only focus on one single genome, maybe also look for this variability. If you found a gene family that has 100 genes in PN, go and see if you find more genes or different genes for this family in the other genomes, because at the end, this could be giving a lot of the differences at the trait level, right, between the genotypes. Uh, we have another question from Aureliano. Hello, yeah. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's an impressive work no, in, in terms of, of, uh, of pangenome. So I have just a, a curiosity. Uh, have you explored different um, tools to visualize the pangenomes? Because, for example, in my case, I have been trying to do with, uh, with other species, and we're still not sure if how practical, for example, is to use tools like Panache or the other one is uh, sequence tube maps. Do you have any experience trying to implement these tools in the in your group? Um, no, and we have been talking about this a lot um, and whether we should invest you know, in exploring and implementing what is out there. And um, we, we do visualize loci in a very static way. And so we can extract from the, from the um, from the graph regions, and they look very nice, you know, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. but they're not browsable uh, tools. Um, and I said we we are thinking about it, but so far the best is still to go back to the original genomes. Okay. Um, and for for many reasons, you know, most of the tools still for doing GWAS, for example, are not designed for um, for pangenome. So at the end of the day, what you need to do is do GWAS independently on every single genome, and then you can inject the, the calls on the graph. 
But looking at the alleles on a graph is a nightmare. I mean, it's, it's very hard to look at frequencies, et cetera. So then you always go back to the, to the diploid uh, single, uh, single genotype. Uh, so I'm not sure, again, here, I think is the future and you're totally right in thinking in those, in those terms. Um, but I'm yet not sure in what context would be good to have a pangenome graph visualized and browsable. When when you have every single genome at that scale, probably you know if you have if you have very fragmented genomes for the genotypes that you use to build the pan genome, the pan genome would be a more easy uh, structure to to browse than the individual genomes. But it's not the case for us. So again, I'm open, but right now we I think yeah, I will stop here. I just already answer I guess your question. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, was the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know what's your experience, Aureliano. You have also been working in this. Well, I'm fighting now with different programs to try to realize which one is the the best. But uh, we are still not sure which one is the one that we want to implement, and because some of them has good advantages, some of them not, and also depends on the quality. So the problem for us is that the quality of the pan genomes that we are using is very low. It's not like uh, the ones that you have it presented with grape. So so still we have problems there. No, so it's too fragmented. But yeah, so it's just, I was just curious to to see. Yeah, you. Yeah. Thanks, Aureliano. We have Camille with another question. Yes, hi, Dario, and thanks for joining us <laughs> despite the time. Um, so yes, I'd like a, a comment from yourself. Um, I was wondering, in your opinion, if uh, the high level of heterozygosity of grapevine, if it's if it adds to the challenge of building a, the, the grapevine pan genome, or if it's actually an opportunity to reach uh, the global grapevine gene pool faster, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I would say yes to both points because, um, um, I mean, Thinking about vinifera, you're basically resolving one haplotype of another cultivar by by sequencing any cultivar. Uh, um, so Cabernet Sauvignon, you already have one haplotype of Sauv Blanc and one haplotype of Cab Franc, so which is which is very important. You're thinking about actually, um, you know, focusing the effort on a selected subset of of cultivars and not you know not tackling the entire three thousand plus cultivars that are out there, but just important nodes in the pedigree of grapes in order to resolve the most common haplotypes. I think that that's uh, very valuable. Um, in terms of complexity, you know, when we build uh, when we build a pan genome, for example, we use every chromosome as, as a genotype. Um, so uh, so we for this one, we had nine, nine, nine species. By the end of the day, we had 18 genomes to use for the pan genome. Um, the, good, the good thing is that um, we know the homologous uh, chromosome, so is yeah. Uh, we know the relationship across uh, haplotypes, and um, it's not an it's not an easy exercise. The tools have been using are tools that have been produced while we're using them. So we are collaborating with the developers of those tools. So, and uh, and again, here here's something to th always think about that uh, most of the tools, as as they are produced, they are optimized for humans. You know, and we are not very interesting. You know, we are not very very heterozygous. The the variability across individuals is very little compared to plants. And um, and for example, for building a pan genome, a lot of uh, the complexity that we introduce by using grapes is the heterozygosity, the structural variability, and therefore the potential inflation of the of the of the um, pan genome that required polishing way more. Uh, significant than what is done for humans. So that's something always to keep in mind. The, the brand new tool that you see online may be very sexy and uh, tweeted millions of times, but may not be actually yet ready for, for grapes. And um, yeah, and that's a problem for us, I guess. Thank you. Thanks, Camille. Um, we don't have any more questions uh, among the Q&A and neither uh, among the panelists. So I think that we are almost ready to, to say goodbye to our attendees. We thank you very much, Dario, for, for your presentation, for 
for being uh, present. Um, yeah, sorry again the about the difference in time. No, no, really, thank you. Uh, we know the, the effort. So uh, we are very happy to have you on board and, and to be part of Grapedia. We have been discussing during this long session um, different ways on how to implement Grapedia, different ways on how we can uh, uh, use the experience from other databases. We have people with different expertise and people working in, in different fields. Um, and, and I think that we can all mm, give this, uh, give a, a, a little sand into this huge vast uh, universe of, of, of databases that, that are available and that we can uh, try to unify and try to take the most advantage of all for, for the whole Grapevine community. I, I would like to thank again all the panelists. I would like to thank the organizers, the sponsors, uh, Sequencia and Novatech from Mercier Group to, to host and sponsor us on this kickoff meeting. And also the attendees, all the people who have been um, uh, joining from everywhere in the world. We, we said at the beginning that we were very happy, more than 200 registrations from all uh, around the, the, the globe. And uh, once again, thank you all for being part of Grapedia. We, uh, we will be having the recordings of the whole kickoff meeting in our website, in our YouTube channel, in our Billy Billy account as well. So uh, stay tuned for the training schools, for the short-term scientific missions um, that uh, uh, hopefully will, um, we will get a lot of uh, proposals and submissions in the upcoming months. And see you very soon. Camille, uh, Camille and, uh, and Marie, I believe that you wanted us to turn on our cameras. Am I right that you wanted to take a, a group picture of, of the panelists? Yes, yeah. but first I'd like also, I'd like to thank you, Thomas and, and Marie for this uh, great uh, organization of this uh, kickoff meeting. And I think that we could have a virtual round of applause for you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you, no, thank you all of you. All thank all of and, <laughs> and yeah, and this is what to it is what totally worth it. It was a great uh, afternoon that we had. So thank you so much for organizing that. Thank it was, you very much. It was very good to see so many people attending the meeting from so many different parts of the world. It was very, very rewarding. Um, so it's good to have such interest, such participation. So thank you to you all. So um, we would like to maybe take a picture among all of us. And, and uh, after that, we will say goodbye. Thank to everyone. Please watch the full recording. We have a, a, a couple of already people interested in being ambassadors uh, of Grapedia. Uh, also, we have a recent comment now saying uh, thanks uh, to everybody for the seminar and the effort in, in building up this huge brief for the progress in, of the science around our favorite species, grapevine. Uh, this comment was raised by Patricio Hendrickson from, from Chile. Um, thanks to everyone again and hope to see you very soon. Thanks, Thomas. And to be honest, I've taken already about 20 pictures. So unless you'd like to do like the thumbs up or something, then. No, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Goodbye, everyone. And, and see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Thanks, everybody. everyone. Thank you. Ciao. And we could uh, have the, the great Pedia babies. <laughs> night <laughs> i've seen the the one from Camille yeah, yeah, as yeah, well yeah. <laughs> what are the grapedia babies are oh, the yeah. children really yeah yeah <laughs> another, hang on. Another... Hang on. okay go uh, hang on hang on uh, amelie has behaved so well during the whole day <laughs> yeah she hasn't been